What's going on, everybody? Cali Death Podcast back once again. Yet another Thursday, episode 41. I uh, hope you guys are doing good. Uh, thanks for fucking coming and checking us out every week. Uh, that's fucking awesome. And what better thing to do than bring back another guest and bring back or bring on a fucking shredder? You guys, if you don't know about this dude, either one of these dudes, you need to fucking start paying attention. We got Nate and Max from Anomalous, dude. What's going on, guys? I'm going to start by saying uh, thank you for that intro this time. Thank hell you. yeah. You guys <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, Most definitely, dude. And uh, thanks to all the subscribers and, and all that shit. We love you guys. Um, yeah, I just subscribed. Hell yeah, dude. We always, <laughs> always love seeing that number grow. And like I said last, I think it was last episode, let's try and get that thing to a thousand by the end of the summer. That'd be fucking rad. But yeah. Uh, Put everything I can to promote, guys. And uh, I, I listen yeah, to every episode. I'm, I'm, I'm oh, the thanks. annoying commenter, too. So you can't get yeah, rid of it. We appreciate it, dude. I mean, that's kind of, we're doing it for, you know, us. We're doing it for our homies. And then whoever else has jumped along, jumped on along the way, it's like, fucking we're going we're we're cruising dude we're not slowing down anytime soon so oh, yeah. keep jumping on the train keeps moving oh yeah cali death train yep i don't know i don't know where the fuck we're going <laughs> <Choo -choo>. but <laughs> <laughs> nice damn oh, sick going, going back to cali cali so uh yeah. max is holding up a, a that's an ontogeny shirt right the hoodie the hoodie that's yeah, sick. I think we, we made 15 of those and we only made yeah. them in that one size. So proud owner. Proud well, I'm owner. lucky because Nate mailed me these together. So well, you're on the yeah. album, so you deserve it. Oh yeah, I forgot. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't mention ontogeny, didn't I? Sorry. Ontogeny as well. Nate's fucking uh, if you guys haven't checked his first episode too, like there's a lot of fucking cool stories and history and that shit. This is this is one of those bands that I've always been a bad at both of these bands. And actually anomalous was, uh, I think I'm not mis If I'm not mistaken, I don't know if it was ontogeny first or anomalous second, because carnivorous was talking to brutal bands back in the day. Nothing ever came out of it, but I started, you know, paying attention to what was going on on brutal bands and anomalous was a brutal that the EP originally came out on brutal bands, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember anomalous it was like first too. Um, what's that? Anomalous came first before. Uh, yeah, I, anomalous was the first band I ever joined. <clears throat> okay, I was so fifteen when I joined Anomalous, so uh, that was the first project that I ever did. I think maybe Ontogeny. I wrote those songs before, but the album didn't come out before. Pillars, you didn't put together until after that EP was already done. Then, uh, well, I had multiple versions of Pillars. I recorded one when I was fourteen years old, and that. Uh, never got officially released, and then when I was 16 is when I did the Pillars of Perversion that's released. That came out, you you had in the physical form. Yeah. That, pack, that yeah. CD that I got, yeah. Yeah, so, but the, the songs were written before Anomalous. I was a guitar player before Anomalous, and then uh, got introduced to this guy. Yeah. Hell yeah. Over, so, check it. I was just listening to your podcast, Nate, so I'm like, did my research. You, were, you said... That cognitive came out like right before pillars, but you wrote pillars like a year or two before it's that. Like, it's almost like I just said it a second ago too. Man. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's up, Max was up getting CDs, so he didn't hear you. But, um, yeah. So that's cool, dude. I mean, how we usually do this is uh, we ask you when the next anomalous album is coming out. Right now? No, I'm just joking. But uh, anom. Uh, so Max. We've already gone back with Nate. We want to go back with you. And then, you know, when you guys meet up and all that shit, that'll come along. But yeah, tell us, tell us uh, everything, dude. What, what's up with uh, when you started playing music? What, what instrument it was? Who got you into it? All that kind of shit. Nice. Yeah, I was listening to Nate's explanation. He went all the way back. Like, That's what mother we like. Father yeah. met. And, uh, no, but I. <laughs> I wrote notes today because I was listening to Nate's podcast. Like, man, I tend to chat so much I forget all the things I want to talk about. That's all good, but, dude. But uh, we've got plenty well, of time. Uh, so before I can remember, I know that my dad played uh, jazz on the radio every single day, and he's he was hardcore jazz the way we're all death metal and shred. And he uh, 
he would hang out in like the black neighborhoods and during the race riots, he told me this story. <laughs> he was like, I did, I just, I just went in there and chilled with my buddies and we played jazz and not see color and just play. So his taste in jazz is like, what did he pretty, play? He played his traveling instrument was trumpet because it's smaller, less actual, like having to tune it and fix it. Cause a saxophone is like a muscle car, man. Like, something goes wrong. You got to open the hood. You got to, and he could actually take it apart and change all the pads and tweak the little springs and stuff, which is not, not every saxophone player could say they do that. Yeah. But he was hardcore. He was born in 1929. So he's like grandpa H. He's, is there a spot inside those instruments that catches all the spit or does it just, yeah, it's pretty gnarly. <laughs> I just didn't know if it like just blow, like you got to like, clean out the hole inside or if it's like a certain receptacle that it falls into or some shit. No, it's like a yeah, valve. No. Juice yeah. it out. No, he, uh, rest in peace. He passed away in 2019. He made it R. to R. age P. 90. Damn. But I still have his Stradivarius. Oh, wow. Sick. And he bent this damn thing himself so oh, that he yeah. could look, he could be like Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the spit catcher. So you, you know, just okay. pop that open and just pour it out. And he yep. ripped these uh, valves off and put like uh, leather. Uh, I don't know what you call them, but he had sausage fingers. So he didn't like his fingers getting stuck in between these pads. Mm -hmm. They're normally like pearl on top. It's like, I don't okay. care. So you said Stradivarius. So is that the same Stradivarius that used to make violins back in the day? That's what I've always wondered. I just know that it's uh, expensive. Yeah, because yeah. those ones go for like those. I was like randomly watching a documentary on those violins, and there's ones that go for fifteen million dollars. Like, uh, oh yeah, yeah, the violins are they're insane. Some of them are like one hundred and fifty years old or something. Yep. But so, uh, somebody just preserves them somehow. Keep them yeah, looking like museum humidity. Yeah. Control. He soldered that on. He soldered this extra ring right here. <laughs> when I sold one of his Selmer saxophones. They were like, oh, we'd give you eight grand, but it has holes in it and like a, a different thumb rest that's been soldered on. We'll give you like 4,500. It's like, whatever. Yeah. He didn't, he'd, he'd cut a sunroof in a, in a Rolls Royce, you know, <laughs> if he had one. <laughs> Definitely sounds like he likes to modify shit for sure. I mean, <clears throat> if you're, if you're using something, you want it to be as, you know, personal to you as possible. So. Whatever makes you yeah. play your instrument better. I'm sure yeah, there's plenty function, of out there. Function over everything. Because he was born in the Depression. So he's like, yeah, I grew up with people coming up to the doorstep saying, hey, let's mow the lawn for a sandwich, please. Wow. But, uh, so he did trumpet and he would travel from Ohio because he was born in Toledo, Ohio and go to New York. And in between there was some like the route where you hit all the towns to play gigs. And he met Miles Davis and John Coltrane and Bird, Charlie Parker and Eric Dolphy and Dexter Gordon before they were big, like when they wow. were teenagers or in their 20s. No shit. And yeah. And uh, so I grew up with those stories. And I remember meeting other people that would meet my dad and they're like, is he, is he, like when he got older, they're like, does he have dementia? I'm like, no, it's, th those are real stories. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I grew up with jazz going in my ears, I guess, every day. Classical during Christmas. Nice. Um, I definitely think that did something. Like, you you put intricate music oh, yeah. for a baby and, like, it. Mm -hmm. the, the brain is meant to be, you know. It helps connections be made. Yeah, really nurtured. Really. So, the funny story my mom would tell me is that uh, I, when I was, like, two or something, I'm saying... Like a song ended on the radio and I'm like, oh, Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson. And my mom's like, no, 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 no. That's Miles Davis. And then it cuts and the, the DJ is like, that was Miles Davis playing Michael Jackson's Human Nature. Wow. Whoa. So recognized okay. the cover early. So I, I, I heard the melody, I guess, and I, I knew what they were doing. Sick. I don't remember that. It's just a funny story. But uh, yeah. um, then when I was five, my dad cause he could build all kinds of stuff. He built me like uh, wooden guitars that were just like to air guitar on, but he put like a metal whammy bar and a strap and he built me a double neck one. He built me one that looked like, um, like Mongrain's guitar, with the, that shape. 
<laughs> Fuck. And then when I was seven, he brought me to Guitar Center and we got this thing. That's a mini guitar, huh? When I was seven, because I couldn't wow. pick up a Les Paul. And I went home and I started going. <laughs> and I did that for like a year. <laughs> and then I got bored and I quit because that's what kids do that are spoiled. They're just like, oh, I'm done. I'm over it. And I just remember watching MTV all the time and seeing, you know, Van Halen. There's all the rest that you could mention, but Van Halen is he's the godfather of tapping. And I was like, dad, teach me. What do I need to learn to get better? He was like, well, let's do scales. So we started practicing the C major scale and learning all the C ma- or all the major scales in every key, all the minor scales in every key. And what's awesome is he would have me read it on sheet music. So I'm really young reading sheet music, watching MTV and being starstruck by that stuff. But I'm like, because he's awesome, he's programming the right theory into my head. And he would literally, you know, be like, if you want to go play around in the street or fool around on your guitar, you got to do practice first. And he'd stand behind me with a stick and point to the, the sheet music. And the other thing I think about that's awesome is it was a trumpet exercise book. So I'm reading trumpet music and I'm practicing on the guitar. So it's like, I forgot to say too, he had me playing saxophone at like seven and eight also. So that taught me a lot about like tone and breath, like holding a note, which is totally different than on the guitar. Um, but yeah, the, the theory at a young age, I think, is probably one of the greatest, biggest life-changing things. Because you go from knowing nothing to, to playing what sounds musical. I mean, when you start doing uh, exercises like trumpet exercises, they're naturally musical. It's not just da-da-da-da-da. It's like da 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 And before you know it, you're able to play like classical classically trained sounding movements plus he had me learn some jazz tunes i don't remember any of it i don't really read music anymore but i definitely pretend you're already playing strings and wind yeah i stopped playing saxophone because i got killer headaches it was like the strap around your neck and i'm holding a big tenor like even Mm -hmm. set it up on a box so i didn't have to have the weight like around my neck but it was like i don't know i think i got to a point where i was like dude I'm eight. I want to shred on a guitar that looks awesome. Yeah. Look at the strat. Look at those, like, what's the whammy bar thing? I want to do that. So he's like, all right, well, let's take the music you're doing on saxophone to guitar. You're going to learn real music. So I don't think he cared for MTV all that much. Just being a jazz probably for, guy. Probably he, for he, good he, reason. <laughs> yeah, he could be an elitist having that taste and that knowledge of music. So, but uh, trying to think back. Um, did he oh, yeah. did he play any like crazy fucking like experimental style jazz around the house too or they're just so here's what's funny he loved Dexter Gordon he appreciated John Coltrane he loved Charlie Parker Charlie Parker is like how do I say it he's like polished you hear all the notes the melodies are beautiful he's shredding but you can kind of understand it Coltrane's going off into the nut stuff Ornette Coleman I don't know if you know Ornette Coleman he's screaming through the horn he's like splitting reeds he's squawking he's going past playing notes he's just like my dad was like kind of like where zorn got it probably he's like i don't listen to that stuff that's not music to me because if you think about when he grew up classical and like when i finally discovered stravinsky he's like let's sit down let's talk about classical music because he already knew but he, he liked the smoother stuff like dexter gordon is like slow breathy they see nice tone and chill, you know? So it was nice to grow up with that kind of like influence from someone saying, stay on this side. (laughs) I think when you get good at the instrument, then you can like go off. If you go off too soon, then you're going to lose out on the, on learning how to control tone and things like that. But um, I'm trying to reference to Nate's, (laughs) <laughs> podcast because I'll always say this. I've never met anyone that was into metal at like age four. Like for me, I, 
my mom introduced me to like, I don't know why she let me watch these things, but like Blade Runner when I was four, the soundtrack is awesome. Uh, Vangelis, I think one of the songs on the soundtrack is called uh, Blade Runner Blues or something. I listen to it even now. It's like an eight hour loop. Gorgeous Pink Floyd atmospheric synth stuff. And then I don't know if you guys remember the Dire Straits song. Uh, is it called I Want My MTV or? Yep. Money, yep. For but the, Money for nothing. But the original intro is like a you know two minute long synth thing just floating in space. And when I would hear things like that, it was like, you felt like there was like a soundtrack to your life. Like everything's more important. You're more important. So I love music like that. So Pink Floyd was a natural thing. I remember learning to fly the video yep. and... I think I heard the wall when I was like nine or something. And that little day loop guitar is one of my favorite riffs ever. And it's not like drums. It's not huge production. It's just a sick little idea that's, you'll know it whenever you hear it. So I learned tapping. I learned the wall. Um, and then when I was eight, my cousin, who's now an astrophysicist, which is weird. He's just like math genius. When he was 13, he showed me Master of Puppets. And I was like nice. too young to, to, to understand the metal side. But that album has so much melody. It has so much like singing and lyrics and musicality to it. There was enough for an eight-year-old, like Welcome, Welcome Home Sanitarium was my favorite song for the longest time because it's, it's super chill. Even, you know, they're obviously it builds and gets heavy and stuff. But like that first guitar solo, the first riff is so sick it's so simple the I think it's on the get, guitar. Uh, well, to talk about the po just the podcast in a whole for a second i think pierce from within and master of puppets we need to start getting uh uh, di a count. a uh like yeah. count of how many times these <laughs> albums come out because come up because it, it really is like i, I talked about that last time remember with jeff i was, said yeah. i started counting them Oh, yeah, nice, I, dude. I, I felt yeah. extremely excluded because i think i am in the only podcast to say I didn't get into suffocation until souls to deny. I, you know, I didn't have Pierce from within in my upbringing of metal. Mine was cannibal corpse more than suffo. So I, I think I might be the only one who didn't have Pierce. No, from I, think, I think I think I had master of puppets in mind for sure. Master I'm the puppets, same way. I, yeah, I, I think... came up with like cannibal and morbid angel and stuff. And then actually my brother was always the one pushing me like do suffocations. This and he gave me like a suffocation tape when I was a kid, but I just like, it was eff effigy on tape when I was like, listening to the black album when it just came out, you know? So it's like, I'd listen to it to kind of like, just be crazy and be like, this is what my brother's listening to. This is weird. You know, like <laughs> I didn't understand what was going on. I was just like, you know, the vocals I wasn't down with and all that stuff. I was still like, you know, but I would just show it to friends to be like, dude, I got this fucking crazy band. But um, no, it started with like the simpler, like cannibal, you know, stuff like that. And then once like, it might have even been like joining Odious got me like deep into suffocation, like because they were like all about it. They were like, it's my favorite, all our favorite bands, like for like, you know, that straight up death metal or kind of edging on technical groovy death metal, I guess you can call it or something. But uh, yeah, that was like yeah, hearing the song for Pierce from Within. I was like, holy shit. Like once I was like deep in that, you know, in death metal, I was like, that's this is the shit, you know, we always lumped that together with Despise the Sun to, you know and effigy and all of that you know but just the pierce is just like the perfect you know, like you know mix and the, it's a full length you know just for a starstruck moment the three of you are are in odious mm -hmm. yeah me joel and anthony yeah i didn't know joel was yep i feel yeah, bad since 2004 but, <laughs> but now i'm yeah. like oh shit i was just <laughs> listening to uh fucking, <laughs> no, uh sorry no, uh, uh, collapse of recreation. Hell yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you know Jarzembeck was another thing that blew my mind. We'll get there, but I was listening to that today, doing my uh, research in uh, Shroud of Impurity. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> uh, off the oh, 2003 yeah. decrepit birth. But uh, damn, being interviewed by Odious. That's... Hell yeah, dude. And we're interviewing. An I'm all shy now. Well, anomalous to me, like the thing about anomalous that that I mean, all like the musicians that I respected and, and like like Naveen, all those guys that like all these people that were like actual insane musicians, like 
they were that's what the reason why i even listened to anomalous in the beginning is they were just like dude you gotta listen to this they were just like yeah they all the musicians i respected it's like a musician's music or musician's band you know what i mean it's a band where like other like respectable musicians are like it's kind of like you know norm mcdonald's the comedian's comic or you know it's kind of like it's the certain kind of things where you show like norm mcdonald people and they're just like oh i don't I'm not really that into it, but like other comedians are just crying, you know, it's, like, yeah. it's because we understand how exactly. insane it really is, dude. I mean, yeah. I re, re, re listening to both the EP. I mean, I, I have the fucking full length in my truck, so that that gets played actually frequently, but playing cognitive dissonance recently after not a, l- listening to for a while, it's a fucking killer EP, dude. And it ripped oh, yeah. my face off, dude. Completely ripped my face off, dude. Skull exposed. Just fucking. I, I'm back with fucking. I got stitches right here because I just got surgery. <laughs> but no, like, it's fucking for real, dude. And I was like, this is this is. It's like the most techish shit. It really is, dude. I'm, I haven't. I can't compare a band that can write songs like that and tech them out like a motherfucker, dude. So, so tech. So I feel like for cognitive dissonance. That there's definitely more tech than that for us, and it's omnivalent for sure. <laughs> omnivalent. Yeah. Well, it, what it, I'm it, saying as a whole, the project as a whole, like I, I haven't okay. seen any yeah. other band touch that that level of tech and make it like still groovy and fucking listenable. But we're getting ahead, dude. Max is still. I know. I was going to say we'll get right there. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there, and like I like I said, I had to write notes because uh, I tend to get so linear. I'll forget everything I wrote here. But you guys said Naveen, and I just have a quick funny story because me and the first drummer in Anomaly, before it was Anomalous, my mm. good friend Steve, we played a talent show at Glen Park. They used to have like open mic talent shows. And I brought that Red Gibson and we played like a Jimi Hendrix song. We played the intro outro to Calculating Infinity's 43% Burnt. <laughs> which went weird with the crowd yeah <laughs> and we played like two anomal or we played an anomalous song we played the old sarah from veil which is on the old demo and we used to call it number seven and then animosity like this crew these dudes that like rolled in together like their hat sideways kind of ghetto and like when you meet people that kind of have an ego but they're not rubbing you the wrong way and they came up there and they wrecked and like i was like damn yeah and they were 16. Mm-hmm, Naveen yeah. was 16 and he was doing the fills and the feet Dude. and the vocalist was sick and the guitar player was sick me and nate went to a mashuga show with with uh, the guitarist from animosity frank <laughs> it was awesome they've always yeah. been that band dude they've always been that top level like i i've never yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's happened. Everybody's fucked up live and shit. But like anytime I see maybe it's because I'm, you know, uh, I'm on the home turf. So I get to see when they really want to bring it because whenever you're home, you want to fucking bring it. So a show at the problem. But it's like an open mic and they're like, they're like, you know, they had it together. They had a set list. They played their songs. And I remember that feeling. It was one of those moments of like, okay. I need to compete with that and I, I better step up because I just got shown up. I mean, granted, I didn't, have, it was me and a drummer, it was just two people. We played like half of a Dillinger song, <laughs> some Jimi Hendrix and Old Anomalous. But uh, I'll always Those remember. Those kinds of things are cool, dude, because it, you get in the moment you're, you're realizing, okay, I need, I, here I am now as a musician and these guys who are the same age as me or whatever they're showing me that I need to do better. That, that's well, it was crazy because they were younger than me by like four or five years. So oh, it's okay. Like, so yeah. So it's like, that, I was like, that these feeling... kids just rolled in and slapped me in the face. And, <laughs> like, and yeah, I'm like, dude. I'm like, I'm sorry. You're better than me. Oh shit. And that moment for people is like, do I keep going or do I quit now? Like they brought enough people with them to have like a mosh pit where like everyone else was like doing hip hop and spoken word and, it's like, dude, they brought their own like crew. <laughs> there were sick fills and like riffs, and it was dope. So I always remember the name Naveen. So hell yeah. But uh, I guess what? Back to me being eight Back. and Master of Puppets. There you so go. So one for Master of Puppets. <laughs> yeah. So I got the cassette tape, and I used to listen to it while I would draw because I'm also, or I was also a visual artist, 
And I always remember like side two when uh, Disposable Heroes would start. It's like this other vibe. And then, of course, we got to talk about Orion. I mean, come on. That song's probably the jammiest, best old school Metallica song with that oh. moment in the middle. I don't know if you guys know the riff in the middle where it's like you're going to exhale the bong rip. <laughs> Just well, like that. The bass solo or what? When, when, the, when it like slows down, it's like. Doo, 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 yep. doo, doo, the bass. Doo. Oh, okay. No, but the triple harmonized melody. <laughs> that's also a bass, dude. That's, that's all, a bass solo? All Cliff Burton. Damn. No wonder. That's dude, sick. you just got your mind blown now with that? That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, that blew my mind as a kid. I was like, that's a bass. And I, yeah. Dude, no, I'll, I'll take all the credit away from Hetfield and, and Hammett whenever I can. All these damn memes of them lately. Like, I, do we remember how, remember how to play? Well, dude, I'm about to see them on their 40th anniversary at Chase Arena. No, I mean, I would, I, I'm so pissed I never saw them. I I'm missed the corn. Metallica. You were probably at it, too. The corn Metallica show at Cow Palace. I, no, I was not allowed to go because I was six years old and I cried very much. You were, you were six years old. <laughs> I was so this, uh, yeah, John went you to were, that. weren't John, you? You mean you were sixteen? No, I was six. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it was in nineteen ninety three. You're six years old and you're like, I'm not going to the corn. Metallica no, not show. the. But didn't you say corn? Corn wouldn't have been on in a ninety three show. Yeah, they were. Really. It was 94, sure, 1994 at the Cow Palace. Fuck. No, nine, it's got to be 96, right? Was it 96? I, I don't have like a Google thing to. Okay. At any rate, I didn't go. I was too young and I cried. So I'm just trying to make me seem younger. So I'm not, you know, <laughs> crying as an adult like I do now, which I That's do. so funny because I have a five year old that would cry for much different shit than Metallica tickets, dude. Dude, I, I got so <laughs> mad. <laughs> so many concerts I couldn't go to being young. It was it was so lame being into death metal. But we'll get we didn't go. We'll get into all the pound shows you did make it to though. The yeah. pound was great because that all ages. But every time Maritime Hall, so many great shows at Maritime Hall that I couldn't go to. The Great American Music Hall, I couldn't go to those for so long, and it was a real issue as a kid. It was a real issue. It was a bummer. And I, I got to go to all the shows you probably cried about with your older brother. For sure, you John. So, Max and my brother are this like the same age. And if you're so, watching, John, that's obvious. That's is that the obvious connection of how you guys hooked up as a. As well, I mean, if you, I mean, if you want me to go into how I met Max. Well, I I think we're still steering away from Max, though. Yeah, go but, ahead, Max, finish, Joseph. Finish what do you got? It was ninety six. Boom. Right. What's Boom. up, dude? Okay, so I was <laughs> I was nine years old crying. I'm sorry, Max. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. I was older. My brain was bigger. I remember that shit. Oh, it so was, that's corn life is peachy then. Okay. It was New Year's Eve. Actually, it was December 29, 30, and 31st, 1996. At nine. Was the second album already out? Yes, Life is Peachy. Yeah, I think Life is Peachy was out. Yeah. And Load was the album that Metallica was touring on. And I waited for that album like the coming of Christ. Yeah, that was a big deal. I remember like watching like MTV with like the lines outside of people like fucking there all night doing like the pre PlayStation wait like like you know like with the Black Friday all the shit like people like camp out like people were doing that for like Metallica and the, yeah that back one. when people waited in line for things that make sense <laughs> yeah exactly exactly um, instead of just, like a a Supreme sledgehammer or something just to date myself that. but connect back um, I've always wanted to bring this up since since Dennis was on and Dennis and Spawn of Possession recorded in Malmo Sweden. I remember going to Malmo in 2002 or three or maybe even 2001 when St. Anger came out and like every single like little bus stop ad and everything was that red fist. It was like all over the town. And that was just it just and stuck how with old me. were you then uh, like 11 or 12. There's your date. Dude, you're just 11 or 12 when St. Anger came out. Damn. Yeah. The best snare ever recorded. Oh, yeah. Bang, bang, best snare bang. tone of all time. dude. But so just every time a Metallica <laughs> album dropped, you know, I mean there was a bunch of ads and people yeah. waiting whatever yeah i just remember and it was like malmo that was like a metal as fuck little city for for people for some reason oh, and like the black album came out same thing like i, I remember that uh, the longest deal like when that came out Every, yeah people, people quad tracked guitars 
I mean, yeah. say what you want about like Metallica being sellouts or whatever. Uh, they made such amazing music and influenced everybody. So yep. now, I think I think it's I fair game to talk smack because they are one of the best ever. Yeah, they're just they're like, in the limelight. They're the target. They can't ruin it. Like I, my wife actually just put on a video last night of the Russia show and the, like them coming out mm. because it starts with this. Uh, I don't remember the name of the song, but I don't know if you guys remember the song they used to play. But when they come out on stage, it's like that's just you. yeah, it's like a uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we love Breaking Bad, and there's this compilation of Breaking Bad on YouTube that has that song. So she was all like, "Whoa, why is that song playing?" I'm like that's what they used to come out to, and it's in front of 1.6 million people <laughs> in Russia, yeah, and it's like Jesus. Can you I imagine mean, being at the back of that venue? I was about to say the same thing. It's like, Dude, it's like you just see like a square. Like you always see like a square, like a lighting, like a square that lights up a little bit. Dude, the, 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 the tower, cool. the tower in the center in the back, the shining lights on them is so far back, and it's that many more people behind it. Oh my god! And they're yeah. playing. And imagine the set list. They must have played yeah, yeah. something off of Injustice for All, right? Uh, yeah, my, yeah, that's my cool. favorite album. So yeah, that's the. Yeah. Well, actually, just we'll to throw there. it out there too, because uh, I'm gonna pull the birthday card so i was born uh two a couple days ago was my birthday but i i was born the day thank you man i was born the day and justice for all came out oh shit july 27th 1984 i was born (laughs) so i was like it's in my fucking blood dog yeah and you're a base no No, it doesn't mean it's in your blood at all (laughs) wait 1984 it's in my yeah. blood because it came out the day I was born. Was Wait, 87. No, he's not talking about injustice. Oh, oh no, no, no. Let ride the lightning. Sorry, ride the lightning. Shit. There you go, bud. God damn it. <laughs> that's that's, that's I never my favorite. It. So there you go. You never Max got stole, Max the stole that album. Sucks. <laughs> I've never like I've never had it. I, I yeah. think loads the best. Really? Song. I don't know. I, you know that. I think Fade to Black is the best uh, Metallica song. So. I mean, it, yes, it is epic, and yeah, it's pretty hard I, to fuck with. That was the one that got me. Yeah. Is that Hulk before is Master of Puppets? Yeah, it's Ride the Lightning album, yeah. See, that's pretty amazing that that's before Master of Puppets. Like, like, it's so epic, it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah. But, it's but what then the again, Ma- Master of Puppets. Is, like, Fade to Black is what made him Metallica in that era of Exodus and Thrash just being it. Fade to Black was like, this is a Thrash band all of a sudden doing this song? You know, I feel like that's what set Metallica on. We're just going to do our own thing. Yeah, and you know they did their own thing on Load too, as far as I'm concerned, and that that's kind of one of those things where Load isn't a good album, but they did their own thing, and I'm happy they did their own thing. You know, it, I remember it, when that very first video came out on MTV, and it's like, yep, until it's sleep, yeah. yeah, like you're trying to compete with Marilyn Manson, yeah, dude. I know like, they're a whole new look, the short hair, the eyeliner, the, all the things. You're like Jesus, sunglasses. and you know who we have to bring up because <laughs> when after the Black Album came out, you know who filled the void fucking pantera so oh, yeah man. yeah exactly mm-hmm. dime forever man yeah totally and I, that's uh, when i've already that around said, uh, far beyond uh, driven was that when far beyond driven came out was around that time or maybe was that before i forget but far beyond driven hit number one on the billboard so that that's was like what i'm saying dude that has yeah. one of my favorite songs broken yeah and yeah that video it's yeah. just them in like a basement and it's so sick yeah, I saw that video on Beavis and Butthead for the first time. Yeah, and dime, yeah. dime, dime, hitting the the symbol with his headstock. Yep, I remember exactly what you're talking about. We're like at the uh, beginning of it, like it's just uh, Phil breaking the light bulb or whatever. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm yeah, getting yeah. chills right now just thinking I know, about I it. A little bit too. It's not good for getting guitar you, solo. Uh, <laughs> um, they used to deliver pizza, and I would literally that. what Pantera was was they filled the void after Metallica too, because my brother handed me a Pantera tape and said. It's like Metallica, but way faster and crazier. So I feel like that's that's the introduction to death metal. Was it's faster and crazier? Like, oh, there's a faster and crazier spiral. Yeah, it's like on. like Metallica was like the major scale, and like Pantera came and like augmented it a little bit. You know, like changed it around a little bit, like made it their own. You know, I'm glad we have three hours because only in like the last five or six years have I realized how much Mashuga is like Pantera more than Metallica. And that just kind of blew my mind. Like well, those early Mashuga, I remember the, getting that early Mashuga albums and stuff when I was a kid. And like, I'm remember I remember it sounding like Metallica to me. I called like, it I remember like it. Tech Metallica. That's what I would yeah, say. Yeah, Fusion <laughs> Metallica. But his solos on those first albums, Thorndall solos on Contradictions Collapse, are some of the sickest guitar solos ever. 
Honestly, yeah. in those first he's like hours, nineteen. He's fucking Thorndall doesn't get enough credit for how much of a shredder he is. That guy is unreal at guitar. Contradictions collapses the album where you really see him shine. Nate, you're very much like him in the sense that you both are the ones who want your hands on the recording equipment. You know the how difference to record. Is he actually good at it and good. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Meshuga is the best thing ever fucking made. So Meshuga is the best. So I wish I had a Meshuga shirt. I should have one. The Don't fact that you're wearing it, the, the fact that you're wearing a DEI shirt next to me, wearing a Holdsworth shirt in our old promo shot. Well, I'm I guess happy. I did it. I mean, I'm wearing Meshuga right now. I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there it is. I think. <laughs> we'll get there, right? We'll get there, dude. I, guess, I have uh, I have the ultimate fanboy Meshuga outfit it really looks like i am just a little kid with mashuga because i have a hoodie that i take off to a shirt with it i got the <laughs> mashuga shorts with it i look like and i wear them all at the same time too i look i look like a, a do mashuga. they have a mashuga hockey jersey they do i don't i got the running outfit that i don't run in we can uh, hit up murray you need the the hockey jersey then because that's when they were at their best i mean at I shouldn't say it their best. I'm sorry, Mashuga. You're still the best. But <laughs> when they were wearing hockey jerseys and really didn't care in like yeah. the was that late like 90s. Chaosphere era? Chaosphere, yeah. Like around I, mean, that, I feel yeah. like they were always the bar of we kind of don't care because we know we're shoving it down people's throats. When I saw those video videos for Chaosphere where they're in their van with a pencil yep. and they're fucking they they were like comedy. But you listen to their album, and it's like, this isn't fucking funny that I'm listening to. <laughs> Chaos here is the angriest thing I've ever fucking heard. You know? Yeah, that, that was the album that got me into it, yeah. Dude, Chaos Fear is punched through a wall. You are pissed. And then I saw that video, and I was like, this is my favorite band. This yeah, my, my, my brother it. handed me, um, he had Calculating to Infinity and Chaos Fear in, in like a bundle. That's a good oh. bundle. I know, yeah. He's a solo, that's like, the anomalous out. bundle right there. Like, that's <laughs> Do you that's like a the a starter pack? Give them if that. You're not ready for that. That's still that's a lot to chew on, though. I was like, yeah, I was like into Fear Factory and like Slipknot probably at the time. This is like '98. All right, yeah. Joey Jordison, by the way. I know. Oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah, dude. Fuck. Yeah. I it's guess we'll get there chronologically, right? Well, they're they're you keep saying <laughs> that Max, but it's Max is still <laughs> eight years old listening to Master of Puppets right now. Just <laughs> read your notes to us right now, <laughs> so we get it all out of the way. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'll read my notes. Uh, see there, <laughs> no, but see, I, the first thing I started with was uh, Tim helped change my ear by showing me from skin to liquid. Fuck yeah. Do you guys know that song? That's what got me into Cannibal Corpse is that the credits of uh, Live He was Cannibal. like, yeah, look, dude, I know you don't like the Because yeah. he, knew, he knew I didn't like the, the growling. and Me too. I just, Same thing. I mean, I was a grunge kid, and I love Steve Ray Vaughan. Like, I was obsessed with Steve Ray Vaughan. We might as well just skip from eight years old to... To Dude. middle middle school and high school, I'm loving Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, like obsessed with those bands, oh, big yeah. time. But I didn't really try to play that music. I tried to play along with David Gilmour and Pink Floyd and Comfortably Numb solo, mm -hmm. and try to copy everything that Steve Ray Vaughan did. And then later, learning in an interview, Steve Ray Vaughan's like, "I'm just trying to be Jimmy, and I'm nowhere near close." Just epic to hear from that legend. Right? Well, coming from you too, because I mean, you were raised with music theory and stuff like that. And Stevie Ray Vaughan knows nothing about music theory, supposedly, right? He knew nothing, supposedly. It's just, it's because he's like a 10 to 13 year old, like in Austin, playing gigs late at night when he's not supposed to. Yeah. Getting trained by blues greats. And he's got the stank face, totally. soul, and he's just feeling it and owned it. To be honest, like he's pretty much the only blues guitar. I mean, there's probably more you can you can name, but he was the only one where I believed him. Like when, when he hit those high <laughs> notes and shit, like I was like, damn, like you felt like you were like, damn, that guy's pissed. Like you, <laughs> Dude, you actually felt it like and he's squealing on a high E 13 gauge 13. That's what I was going to ask you. I was like, was that true that he was doing like 13 gauges to, or 13 gauge tuned to like what half step down or or normal? Like that's insane. It's yeah. literally insane. I mean, he had to like tighten all the springs in the guitar so the bridge didn't come up and break off. Jeez. Uh, I don't even want to mess with that. I mean, you cut your fingers in half, but what's the like a, normal like power gauge. lifter? Uh, what's the normal? Normal is like nine. Ten, nine or ten. Yeah. Eleven is nice and thick. Twelve is yeah. like an acoustic guitar. Thirteen's like big ass painful. 
Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> it's like putting it's himself like through it. Vaughan, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, the only time I played on strings that thick is when I was like, oh, I need to turn my six string into a drop C because that's what Cryptopsy does. But they're still tuning down two notes. So the strings mm-hmm. aren't quite as tight. But yep. Steve Ray Vaughn's like, no, I play on the beefiest strings to make. So, <laughs> you know, Jesus. I'm a fucking voodoo he's like a He's like a finger power lifter. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> finger weights yeah. probably would be yeah. a rock climber or something yeah. dude did you see that oh i won't even talk about that bro that rock <laughs> climbing documentary that guy had five thumbs bro you should have seen his five head. thumbs <laughs> dude. it was crazy dude there's a still shot on the next netflix thing it looks like it's it looks like a foot it's crazy oh. five thumb death punch <laughs> <laughs> five thumb death punch <laughs> okay so but yeah max jim i'll say this too i'm proud to say that i knew of buckethead in 96 yeah because my friend gave me a uh cassette tape of praxis which had bootsy collins on bass and i was getting in into parliament and george clinton in in freshman year just digging the the feel of like a good i won't say funk song i'll say like a parliament song Mm because i don't really listen to anyone else but them if I'm listening to fun, mm-hmm. like flashlight and uh, the mothership connection and all that yeah. stuff. So then all of a sudden I'm listening to Buckethead. And if you listen to that old Praxis album, I don't know how many there are. I just have this one. I mean, that shit is insane. It's like Thorndall, but well, I guess Thorndall was already around. I wasn't aware of Mashuga until doesn't he put out like an album a fucking month or something? Or yeah, yeah. I know there's a, there's a funny, there's a fun little snippet for a quiz. Like how many albums do you think Buckethead has? Just take I a guess. I would say, I mean, I'm you know, you big. know, kind of, you know, kind of. I got to say I'm, I'm, like 500 plus. What, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> <shut> the <laughs> fuck up. Yeah, <laughs> that know, Monsters like, and Robots Jesus. album is really sick. He's got, he's got like 300, right, 200 plus. Albums. 200, 200 plus. Albums. 300 albums? Yeah, go, go check out Spotify after this. But, go check out. Do you know the Elephant's Man, the Elephant Man's Alarm yes. Clock? That's like the best one he ever did. I swear. I don't to even, God. dude. He released one like while we had this podcast. Like, yeah. he, he released dude, that's, one like. That's but ridiculous. that's why you need someone to recommend it because there's too much for any there's new fan much. to like figure yeah. it out. But I will just tell you, that's the one. Yeah, for me, for, for he, did with he probably did a bunch of them but with Claypool. Yeah, yeah. There's Bernie yeah. a bucket brain or bucket of Bernie. Colin brains. all Claypool's bucket of Bernie brains or some shit yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the with only like one the, I really had. I didn't I, like the, I didn't even realize that the dude made that much music until like a few years ago. Yeah, yeah no, Somehow, it's, it's like, insane. It's like it was 360 yeah. last time I checked or something. And that was like two years ago. So 360? Like, something like that. And you said you were acting like my 500 was like. Yeah, that but who the off. fuck would say 500? Like the second place is like 40. <laughs> like, what do you, why would you say 500? <laughs> is he trying to beat Frank Zappa? I mean, no, he, already, he, yeah. he like crushed he crippled him. Frank Zappa. I think Zappa's Frank only Zappa. got like 80 or 90 out before he died. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not, yeah. I, I'll take Frank Zappa if there's going to be that much music released, but yeah. Buckethead's the shit. Buckethead totally. is the shit. I didn't realize that his, his idol teacher was Sean Lane. Mm-hmm. So Sean Lane. I learned that recently. But, and uh, didn't didn't uh, Paul Gil- Gilbert t- uh, teach him or something like that too? I think he Sean Lane or Buckethead, a Buckethead, probably. I want to yeah, I mean. say that was like there's pictures of them together. Like there's an unmasked picture somewhere of them together back in the day. When he was I've seen kid. the unmasked picture with him and Sean Lane. Okay, yeah, yeah. With like the most humble smile on his face, like yeah, because yeah. Sean Lane's one of those guys where I'm like, he, I don't like comparing him to Holdsworth because. There's the story that he, of him seeing a free concert when he was 20 and he mm-hmm. didn't know who it was. And it was Alan Holdsworth Damn. and that changed Sean Lane's life. But I mean, it's like for where he couldn't make up in the theory that Holdsworth could do the speed. I remember hearing Rusty Cooley talk about Sean Lane oh, and he's yeah. like that guy. Cause it's like beyond shred. It's yeah. It's, it's like alien it, shit. I, it doesn't sound like shred. It sounds like an amazing fucking musician on lots of coffee i mean it sounds like like a harp like a harp with a bunch of delays it's just like it's, it's like, so it's music like, it's jazz like it's like charlie parker where dude's playing lines and melodies but super fast but because it's not just a repetitive scale up and down mm-hmm. it, it's it's not boring it doesn't just numb you it's out. like singing or some shit yeah and then yeah. and then for him to have like his southern stank 
yep. all of a sudden hit some bluesy note and you're like, Oh, you could play Jimmy and Steve Ray Vaughn too. Yeah. I loved yeah. hearing those, uh, those like uh, instructional videos with him. And then you finally mm-hmm. hear his voice. Like, so, Hey guys, how you doing? And <laughs> like, you're know, like, this is Sean Lane. <laughs> yeah. You hear the- Holdsworth talk. Holdsworth's like, fucking don't want to be doing this video, but yeah. Cool. <laughs> it's kind of got a Jars and Becky vibe to his like talking. Like he's a super monotone and like, you know, got the British. He's British, right? Isn't he? Holdsworth. Holdsworth. Yeah. 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 I, I think like he's Scottish. Or Scottish. Okay. He did not like the fact that he made this. He was like, that was a bad idea. I'm like, dude, chill. <laughs> like, yeah. Just chill. But I mean, that's, that's a so crazy different. instructional DVD book. If there's anyone watching who wants to learn some Alan Holbrook stuff, it came with that- a book, and my dumbass let a city college buddy, not a real friend, borrow it. Well, they I oh, bought. They still oh, have yeah. them on Amazon. I bought it for nine. I know, but I mean, the phys- if I had the physical booklet, ah, I have it. They sell for nine ninety nine on Amazon, dude. You can get it, bro. Jeff, give get Jeff Bezos to the moon again, man. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, I do every day. Oh my goodness, the way Holdsworth thinks about guitar is crazy because he thinks about it as the whole fretboard. The whole fretboard, yep. And, yeah, yeah. And that's patterns. Frank Gabali fretboard talks about that too. <laughs> have you ever Frank seen? Have you ever seen Frank Gabali's old uh, instructional videos with like oh, the, yeah. the girls with the yellow guitar? Yeah, and like the like the workout. Girls in it or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> see that. <laughs> but crazy. Frank Cabali is another one that's just yeah. He's unreal and he's in that Holdsworth. There's there's songs where he's playing with Holdsworth too, and it's mm-hmm. it's insane. You know, yeah, just he's the crazy. It's, it's on a uh, a Mark Varney project. Yeah, there you go. I know Max was my introduction to like that shred stuff. You know, and Dude, one and, of Holdsworth solos on that album is one of my favorite of his. It's. And it's crazy because Holdsworth sets up his whole section, like these synth chords come in all of a sudden, and he's it's like it backs him up even more. Yeah. And nice. it's just all it's all Holdsworth ethereal and cosmic sounding all of a sudden. And it's like just, the, the Holdsworth licks are what get noticed more than his chords. But if you've ever looked at like the chords he's doing, they're ridiculous. They're insane. I don't even know how he has enough fingers to do it sometimes. So I mean I, he's got I, huge hands, know. so yeah, yeah, but he's a small fretboard too. He's that small keysel or carving, I guess, is what he was using. But not a good. Like, but that's not an excuse because in the '90s he he was experimenting on baritone guitars, which are like this much mm-hmm. longer on the neck. Yeah, and he had that. He played a Fender in his old like late '70s. Videos. That red? No, no, '84 uh, in uh, Tokyo. He's got the red yeah, strat. Yeah, he, he played a red strat. Yeah. Well, we, me and Max were lucky to see Holdsworth at Yoshi's. I bought years. like mm. I bought these guys tickets you at did? least once. I don't know if I did it multiple times, you but bought, I bought like set, I bought seven. Literally, I tickets. was a broke high school student saying, okay. "I can't afford a Yoshi's jazz show." I'm sorry, yeah. dude, I can't do it. And he went, "No, it's Holdsworth, dude. I'm buying everyone tickets to see Holdsworth." And we I think all, I bought three hundred dollars worth of tickets, dude. and it was. Yeah. It, we all sat there like, oh, well, I get it now. And we never missed him when he came back again. I, I, we saw him with the bass player for King's, King Crimson, and he played with dude. Chad Wackerman. And uh, and was, Yoshi's is a killer venue, dude. Was it Yoshi's SF or Oakland? It was Oakland. Oh, yeah. SF is closed now. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, SF Jazz yeah. is so much better, though. I saw Al oh, yeah. Neal at the SF one before it closed up. Yeah, I saw yeah, the bad plus. Jazz is just... First off, the SF Jazz is the largest building dedicated strictly to jazz in the United States, which is so cool. Another wow. Bay Area gem, if you ask me. Uh, I've seen Tiger and Hamasian play in a room that's a, a 15 by 15. Oh, you know, I man. sat right next to Tiger and playing a piano, and I was just like, I don't know if you know this, you're my favorite. And he just yeah. wanted, you, know? you, you turned me on to them. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. After that episode, I actually remember I saved it and I have it in my Spotify. He had, I, when I went over there, to his pad to do those odious vocals that didn't get used. Um, we'd chill and he was just feeding me shit. And, and that was one Same of them. Here. And I was like, literally, I got to fucking snap a shot of this right now. Cause I, I can't forget this. And I, yep. that's still an album that I listen to. And it's, and it's cool to like have playing around the house too. Like my kids. Yeah. Like yeah. To get it's down one of those jazz too. bands where you always hear people say, I don't like jazz. Cause it sounds like elevator music. I don't like jazz because it just seems like it meanders and it's soloing. 
He writes songs. He writes. Dude, he songs. makes jazz metalheads can get into. That's yeah, it's crazy. called Mock Root, right? That yeah. Album. yeah. Dude. Well, his newest one is out of this world. It's it's my favorite album. Yeah, I'm just person? referencing the one you had showed me, and there's some like parts in it where I'm like, how could he separate his limbs to play that? You know, Absolutely. there's some breakdowns where his left hand is doing something totally different than his right hand in timing. Yeah. Nate sat me down and showed me the song "Entertain Me." Yeah, and uh, I remember thinking. Man, this would be an awesome mashuga like Genty song. And th- like four or five different groups of people have done that now. And yeah. it's one of my favorite tunes to solo over because. Yeah, if you're listening perfectly. and you don't know who we're talking about, so what's his name again? Tigran. Tigran. Yeah, dude, if you're a mashuga fan and you like piano, and you'll enjoy that. And as a drummer. Jacob Collier. Yeah, the drummer. Jacob Collier is. Oh, yeah. Jacob Collier's harmonies. It are the sickest thing ever made as well. Uh, everything I say is the sickest thing I've ever Man. made. But <laughs> Jake, Jacob Collier's idea of harmony is is the most so unique. It's it's so crazy the way he shifts into chords. And I got to see him in SF Jazz too in a ten by ten room as well. It's it's the best venue for jazz. The sound is so good. So SF Jazz, check it out and check out those bands too. Hell yeah. It's funny we're supposed to be talking about death metal, but there's so much music uh, dude. that needs to be. We're building this pyramid to get to mm-hmm. screaming. Kind of what makes a lot of, <laughs> no, I mean, building I the mountain. I remember hearing an interview on. with Cryptopsy, right? Yeah. And then John Lavoisier talking about and Flo talking about. Uh, I think it was and then you'll beg or you know Whisper Supremacy and and then you'll beg are like the two albums that are a lot alike. Yeah. And everything like around Salvo. it is different. You know, None So Vile is like the most epic, perfect death metal album in my eyes. And then the stuff that came oh. after it, that's cool. But those two albums, they're like, there's a riff I could say that was inspired by a funk band. That other riff is inspired by like African tribal beat. And I love hearing that some band that's the most brutal fucking shit you've ever heard mm-hmm. wrote a brutal fucking riff inspired by something not brutal. Yeah. <laughs> so all their so actually Nate, played I- through their lens. Nate, I wanted to ask you because you brought up uh, that Tigran played with uh, some uh, someone from King Crimson. Are you going to that show? I'm I'm going. It's like an a uh, Friday in Concord, or it's a Thursday in Concord. Yeah. Uh, so th- if it's Thursday, I can't go. I wake up at fucking three o'clock in the morning. Just letting you know, um, I have um, in I mean information from Trevor, who's like obsessed with King Crimson, that it's going to be their last show around here ever. Oh! <laughs> Tony Levine. Uh, uh he's Tony Levin's playing with uh Levin. Yeah, Sorry. he's playing with uh it's Adam Levine. Um <laughs> Tony uh Tony Levin's playing, yeah, and they have uh well uh, what's the other guy? The gu- uh, gunner or something? What's his fuck? Trey Gunn. Isn't he playing too? And they have I like have, a I have no idea. I have King Crimson, uh I like them a lot, but I don't even know if I would know any of their names, to be honest. I, I, yeah. I listen to all of their albums. I'm also terrible with names just in general, too. But yeah, I know, yeah. you know, Dis- Discipline is the album that I listen to. And I think what got me into Discipline was Anima, Tool, and, you know, it's the same producer. And mm-hmm. Discipline is what made Tool, Tool now, if you ask me. Like, that, that's, Definitely. you can hear it. You can hear Anima in that. But, I think uh, I don't know if I'm going to make that show, bro. I don't know if I could do it. There's the, did uh, you see mom- King Crimson open for Tool? Anybody? No, yeah, Trevor right? did. My roommate uh, did. Tim, yeah, Tim and Steve saw it at like uh, in, in Oakland at some small place. You saw I was you got open for Tool. Dude, you, I was going to bring that up. I'm sorry, bro. I didn't look at your notes before the show. I, <laughs> I should have consulted the notes, man. <laughs> No, it's kind of hard to um, keep the chronological timeline of my musical Dude, journey. You're still right? eight years old and master. <laughs> <laughs> I still want to know what your, your dad was doing in the race riots, hanging out, and well, he lived in he lived in Ohio, so Toledo. Okay. You said or, I am so sorry to call back at this point, but you were you were saying something about that how that shaped his jazz tastes, and then I kind you kind of got into it later, but I was like waiting on that, like sorry. Uh, well, Something that's funny that he said about jazz. 
is that back in the day, I want to say the feds, like the fuzz would mm-hmm. come through and check and see uh, uh, who, like, are you playing copyrighted music or not? Because you're not allowed to do that. That's crazy. Because uh, when you, you had to be in a... Um, it's like old school YouTube. <laughs> For real. My, my, my brain, Nate, help me. What's it called? You're part of... Uh, Dude, these are your pipe, notes. I don't know. No, no, no. Pipe fitters, whatever. What's it called? Pipe uh, What? When you have to join a union. That's the word I'm looking for. There you go. Oh, so, all right. so, <laughs> uh, so being a musician back then, you had to join like the musicians union. And you had to like stay in line. Thing. And you had to make sure you didn't play anything you weren't supposed to. So that makes sense. when they wanted to play something they weren't supposed to, they had to fuck it up. They had to make mm-hmm. it unrecognizable. Mm-hmm. And so when the guys came in with the cigars and the hats and they're staring in the back, like are you playing, uh, you know, are, are you playing whatever copyrighted thing? They're like, nah, I put a flat five there. It's my song. Yeah. So I thought yeah. that was always interesting because <clears throat> not everyone says that about jazz. A lot of people want to take credit for, Oh, I made it crazy. And I, I kind of believe him because he was very, uh, you know, he's a whole generation before the hippies. So things were very in alignment, you know, World War II, a whole country being like, let's give all of our metal and our rubber to the war. Yeah. <laughs> music is not that important, even though music is what we're playing to get through this crap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know, it's a whole different uh, perspective than I've ever seen. Or, Could you just but, uh, change the key on a song and, and have that be the difference of copyright? That's a good question. I'm sure they just stacked it on, you know, change Dude, the key, actually, change the time. It's crazy with copyright law. So oddly enough, who was involved severely in copyright laws is George Harrison because he got sued for My Sweet Lord. Uh, and he describes what he had to do to prove that he wrote my, the song My Sweet Lord is a good song. Uh, he actually gave him a guitar and he had to play it in front of the courtroom and describe how he wrote My Sweet Lord and, wow. and, and what did it. So then describing hey, these, these chords are all just in the air. We're playing, you know, we can do this. So th- they determined that there's there's reasonable ways to say things can be mutual ideas and sharing chords can be one of them. He ended up paying that guy millions of dollars, though. Uh, I think it was yeah. the Shirelles did it. Can you imagine being on that jury? You get a free George Harrison concert. <laughs> You're like, dude, you know this, and I get to see George. I got jury duty, and I get to see the Beatles. This is awesome. <laughs> was it crazy? Wow, I'm eight years old in Master of Puppets right now. We saw how it went back to the 1940s. <laughs> now, Creedence Clearwater got almost sued for plagiarizing himself. No, he what? did get sued, yes, for stealing his own songs. What the he fuck? Said, how, uh, how does that yeah, work? John Fogarty didn't own any of the rights to his own songs. And when he released his solo album, the, oh. uh, the company that owned the song sued him, said, you sound too much like Credence. And he said, well, I am Credence. So, so, I I thought, like so that's kind of shining some light on it. Because I always thought that uh, if you re-record something, well, I mean, I guess it's all in your contract. It's all in the individual contract. But so I it depends that, on what your copyrights are. You can copyright uh, your charts, your sheet music. That's you're actually copywriting your composition. Mm-hmm. If you're cop- most of what we copyright as death metal bands is going to be the recording. That's what it you're, is. Yeah, you're copywriting the master recording, saying if it sounds like this master, and that's why you can have remasters and whatnot. Uh, but you can't have. Any, if you chart out your songs and write your notes out, that's when you can say, I wrote that song. I wrote those parts. I wrote those <clears> parts <throat> together in sequence. Do they accept it has power to have tab? A certain percentage, <laughs> they, it has to have a certain percentage of rhythmic note uh, similarities to meet that criteria. To Damn. Get I'm right. sure that shit gets, yeah. So, so you're eight, uh, Max, and uh, <laughs> you. It's like a Joey Diaz episode. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> So, Master no, Tim, just talk about Tim for God's sake. Right? Animosity yeah. plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a Tim. Tim. Skin to liquid, Max. You listen to Skin, skin to liquid. liquid. Skin to liquid. <laughs> yeah. So Tim knew I uh, wasn't digging the vocals, but I hope all of you guys are familiar with from Skin to Liquid. Yep. <clears throat> that 
was the first time I heard, besides corn, I can't remember. I must have been into corn already. The, the seven string craze, you know, it was mm-hmm. like this whole wave. It was like when skateboards had turned into banana boards. Like, what? Things are changing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm hearing this song that's dropped down. So I love that. There's no vocals. So I love that. <laughs> and the riff is super long. And the drums are weird and the texture is weird. And I was like, he put the headphones on on me and like left. He was like, look, you'll like this because you got to start getting into the stuff that I'm getting into. Because he was into... He was into this like almost a decade before I even got into it. Nice. And he has a funny story where he's like sleeping over at his girlfriend's house. And some other That's a uh, great Southern trend killed for the listeners. Yeah. On that. And he puts on the cassette at like midnight and everyone's tripping and like trying to go to bed and it's like, ah! freaked everyone out. So I wasn't, uh, I wasn't there yet. I was like, oh, it's the Pearl Jam, man. <laughs> but uh, I, for some reason I got into skin, the liquid. And started experimenting, listening to Cannibal Corpse, and then being like, "Oh, these lyrics are funny." <laughs> yeah, because you got to kind of take it with a, a little bit of salt there, a like grain of yeah. salt. But um, you guys in Nate's podcast said something about Fear Factory, and I got to go there too because it was like Corn got me into set low seven string, and you know, there's the whole new metal like Limp Bizkit thing, and popular on mtv crap you're still a teenager you're still affected by what mtv's pumping out there mm-hmm. and then uh of course slipknot and i loved the first album only i'm sorry guys i'll only listen to the first yeah. album that's all good <laughs> iowa. sorry yeah I'll, i stopped like at iowa. iowa i was bummed but, when iowa came out were you bummed did follow the iowa? leader come out in before 2000 that was uh 98 90, yeah, that was 98. Yeah. Oh, it makes perfect sense because the vocalist of Slipknot was like, Corn's soft now. You gotta do something about it. And I was like, you guys are doing something about it. And they had like turntables and stuff, but it was like tasteful and done in a weird, like they even could appeal to Marilyn Manson crowd because they looked weird. And I I must say I was Nate, you remember the poster on my wall that I burnt the edges and I had drawings. It's kind of like where my mask stuff is influenced by joey jordanson you know i'm not gonna i gotta give props where it's where it's due you know this is my high school uh (laughs) self-portrait i I, I mean i I, if you want me to start getting into your room max i will well i I mean it's it burnt down so it's kind of like your your room is important to the anomalous story absolutely it was it was the womb it was so i'll just get into it now your your your, what were your uh your room so Max lives right down the street from me. Uh, I will say I met Max through my brother, right? Max and my brother knew each other. Just, I don't even know how you knew my brother, but just Alan. Playing, uh, okay, Alan. Okay. So it was playing music, I think. And, Alan grew, and I was in ontogeny with my brother. Originally I was playing those songs. And I remember I didn't know anything about Max until I was 15 and Chaz, actually, the guitar player for Soul Thunder, would rehearse at Max's house, and they'd see Max and Tim playing uh, songs. So he said, hey, they need a bass player. Then you start playing shows. Nate, you can play guitar really well. You should try out. And Max showed up at my brother's house. And I remember playing ontogeny songs for Max like, hell yeah, we're killing these songs. And then Max started playing, and I was like, where the fuck have you been my entire life? Like, why? Has, I was so mad at my brother. I was like, you didn't show me this guy the whole fucking time. I was so mad. I, I got, I, I got the 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 craziest, just mind blown feeling watching him play guitar because he was doing things like I couldn't imagine a guitar player doing right in front of me. Like you can see shredder videos. I think at that time I didn't even have shredded videos. I was I th- just I think John was, mad at me. was that? I think John was a little mad at me. Can I can I is it okay to tell the story of how I, I did him dirty? No, I don't even know how you did, but no. You did my brother dirty? What the fuck are you talking about? This- I don't no. I don't want uh, I don't want LSD to be a, something that gets this bit cut out. Nah, dude. We, what the fuck we, did you do, to my brother Max? We enjoy. Uh, he wanted me to try out for Driven. 
Oh, and, oh, I and, didn't know. yeah. And he brings yeah. his rig over to my house, like a crate stack. He's, so he's all he's all business. And uh, for some reason, I was tripping balls in the middle of the day. And he sets up and I'm it's all like loud with feedback. I'm like, oh my God, bad vibes. <laughs> I just want to listen to Pink Floyd. He starts shredding, and I think he played like a bunch of solos off of Master of Puppets. Mm-hmm. And I plug in and I'm like seeing rainbows and I'm kind of shaking and I'm like, dude, uh, I got to let you know something. And I'm, I just dosed and it's really coming on right now. I don't think I can do this today. And he's like, okay, that's cool. Unplugs his guitar. So, oh, that, so how he did him dirty was he got, he got all the way over there with all his equipment and then he just, yep. like, nah, dude, can't do oh, it. That, that's all good. <laughs> okay. I thought we were talking about we, we laugh about it all the time, though. Nate thought always, some serious even shit. Even if it's was just an act, I'll always be like, yep, you did that. It's fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that ain't doing him dirty. That's so he's like, he's like, I'm not telling my brother about this piece of shit. <laughs> that's, that. Yeah, that was the moment he was like, I'm, I'm keeping you a secret from Nate now, dude. Dude, but yeah, I, 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 the secret was out as soon as I saw Max play guitar, though. Honestly, as soon as he started playing, I went, you're going to teach me every one of those notes because I need to learn that. And uh, I remember he played, I don't even know the actual name of the song. We call it Eight. What's, the, what's Eight called? Oh, now? Metastasize. Metastasize. So he played Metastasize, and I, I said, I'm going to learn that song right now. And I, I learned that song, basically. I sat with Max, and I learned it. And I practiced it all night and I came back the next day and I played it with him because I was like, I, I need to be in this band. I need to practice with these guys because uh, I was getting better at guitar than my brother because my brother kind of stopped practicing and it would be like, on Tajani rehearsal, would be like, come on, John, like, I'm like get back up to speed. We got to get you there. So seeing Max was like, dude, now I got to get up to speed to somebody. That's what I want. I want to practice to a different level of playing and, seeing Max and learning those songs was teaching me some cool chops and stuff, but I will say what Max was getting into with Tim introducing skin to liquid. Tim's a huge part of the anomalous story, the anomalous sound bringing the death metal into Max's world. Just Tim is huge in this. Tim would search the internet and find music and bring it to my house. He would sleep at my house for months and, I, before I joined Anomalous, Tim came to my house when I was nine years old and I saw him play guitar and went, oh my God, you're a crazy guitar player. So I didn't know Max at that time. He was trying out for my brother's band too. And I saw him play guitar like, wow, you're the best guitar player I've ever seen. Then I saw Max I was like, you're the best guitar player I've ever seen. And then I went to the, their house, Max's room, which is where the story came from. And I remember walking in, Max's room had tagging all over the wall, just if you got a Sharpie, you'd write on the wall. There was pictures everywhere. It was such a different environment than I grew up in. My family, if I did that, I'd be fucking beaten up and shit. <laughs> so when I went in there, I was just like, this is how an artist lives, I guess. huh? This is what they do. And I started just watching Max and Tim play guitar together and saying, you guys are the most solid guitar players I've ever seen play back to back in my life it was unreal and they were playing with no click no drums and they sounded perfect in rhythm with each other and that was just it i said i'm gonna be in your band and learn every one of these songs i can and i i did and i luckily lived right down the street from max so i could just go after school i was 15 years old just walking from school straight to max's house and i'd I'd start jamming learning songs and max's room was just a haven for finding new bands like i needed to know hey max what what did you do to play like that what did you listen to and he showed me holdsworth sean lane buckethead he showed me all the videos all the songs he played to them too and i was just in this world of i gotta get better as a guitar player and 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 i'm still there with max because uh you know he's my favorite guitar player still i'm lucky to be in a band with my favorite guitar player honestly Ah. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate to do it, but it's well. It's, let me let me throw it back in pra- in praise. Me and Don't Tim started writing. Me and Tim recorded a like Tool inspired, Marilyn Manson, Nine Inch Nails inspired album in '95 on a four track that I have back there. Damn. It's actually it's songs with solos, and Tim's the driving force of the vision. So we've been writing stuff for a, a while. 
probably took a break from 96 to 2000, listening to all the stuff coming out then. And then like right after high school, we started jamming with some dude in Half Moon Bay who was a drummer. We would go there every couple of weekends and we wrote song one. <laughs> if we're doing the number thing, we wrote song one and then me and Tim later wrote song two. And then like two through five are these like lost songs. They suck. They're interesting, but you know, it was learning, listening to new kinds of metal and stuff. And then six, seven, and eight. And eight is metastasized, like the most. Seven is, seven is the seraphim veil. Yeah. So for everyone watching and listening, metastasize is track eight. And Nate learned it in two days, three days. Mm. He had it down on the third day just to work out a couple things. Took me and Tim like a year and a half to write that song. It's, <laughs> it's got all these nooks and crannies. And I can remember like piecing it together, like Jenga Tower with Tim. And this kid comes over. That's the younger brother of John, who's the guy who showed us all the bands and took us to all the dope shows. And his little brother, just like a wizard. I got it, guys. Like, dude, you don't even have a beard. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was pretty awesome. We were like, score. That we're keeping this dude. And you're right down the street from each other. That's fucking, it's like, dude, it was great. Dudes are it was finding was- musicians across the world. And you're like, oh, dude, I just grew up down the street from him, dude. Yeah, and yeah. we were all in San Francisco, too, which was also great. You know, now the Bay Area is so spread out. Having three people live in San Francisco is, like, not going to happen usually. But what I noticed about Max and Tim and the way they write was nothing seemed like it was done ever. It seemed like f- the music was that always... Got worse. It was always being reassessed, always evolving, always, no, we got to change that. We got to, because we are getting better, we got to change this. We got to redo this whole section. And it really started making me more cognizant of how to songwrite and be thematic and really be intentional in songwriting a lot. And let, less like, oh, that sounds heavy. Put it out. Good to go. You know, more like, well, what am I doing? Why, what, what am I building up to? What is, what is going to come through in these songs? And, Tim is a huge part of that, and he always thinks thematically and, and big themes. And I feel like the sound of Anomalous was started by Max and Tim in those rooms doing that, and that that vibe of continually changing didn't change when I joined the band either, because that's what I walked into, and I kind of accepted that when I walked that was, into it. That was pretty cool, like listening to, I mean, Dennis from Spawn talk about it too, because going from Cabinet to Noctambulant, um, cabinet they had time to stew on it and change things and 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 actually he said you know either way he pro- almost thinks that like it almost is better just to have it and just jump in the studio like go just because you know they would just if they have too much time to think about it they would just go back change things marinate on it do this change and me oh, and we'll actually there. <laughs> yeah me and carrie actually same thing when me and carrie first started our our band it, that's that was our disease that we had we had to we would, you know, we would sit at home listening to it and just be like, okay, well, we could change this. And then just like every other day, we'd come over with like a new version, just change, it was constantly changing to the point where it, we didn't like it anymore. You know, it was yeah. like, we liked That's it. That's the worst. <laughs> yeah. When you actually liked it in the beginning and then you, you change things constantly where it's like, fuck, we need to like backtrack. Is there like an undo button on this? Let's go back and like, like a control V. Can we control V this and go, go back and undo to like the fourth you know, version of it, not the 19th that we're at now. And we're just constantly changing, you know, I, I, I'm going to be skipping here a little bit, but the song Prematuria on Omnivalent, mm-hmm. maybe it's the second riff. It's a diminished riff. And Nate and I actually wrote a chill, like normal song version of it a while ago. And it was supposed to just be like, remember Nate? What's Prematuria? Isn't that 16? The 17, it's the first track. Okay, so okay. So so you and I like had an old version, and when we showed it to Tim, he was like, that's basic and lame. Like, chop it up, use like one eighth of it, make it a complete like tapestry that's unique, and it goes by in five seconds. But the riff that you and I had written was like a riff that could have been played eight times and been like, you know, a quarter of a song. Yeah, and that's so, that, that's really what I'm saying, Tim's name is just, it's so integral in the sound of Anomalous. It was really that, that what Max just said, like, you guys suck. That doesn't sound good. 
that would be a literal thing that could be said where you, you we think we got some tight and it's like, no, that's garbage, dude, you got to redo it. And you're like, oh, shit, we got to redo this. And we would. And we'd work the three of us to make it something that's not what it was when it was garbage, but now it's some weird thing that almost sounds like what it was the first time, you know? And that was a continual changing thing every time we'd listen to songs. And it Prematuria, so 17... Uh, that's the first song on Niblet. That's like, I remember Tim saying, we need to write a, a really shreddy technical song. And that's when me and Max wrote that riff. Like, we've got the shreddy part. He's like, yeah, but that's stupid shred. You know, you got <laughs> we got to make it cool shred, you know? So, you know, it's, uh, he's a, such a, just a huge part of the sound and, and uh, the songwriting. So one day have Tim on this, if you, if you get it. I mean, Definitely. I, I have trouble remembering who, if it was me or Tim, that would find certain things, but I'll just give it to Tim. He he found the Decrepit Birth song, put it on a blank CD, like scouring the internet for these insane, brutal, fast songs, bring them to my house. And we're like, we suck. We got to up our game. <laughs> you know, like he, he brought Ion Dissonance over and that was... That was big. Ion, Ion Dissonance... Fuck can be the main for anybody that doesn't like Omnivalent or if you're trying to map why it sounds the way it sounds, it's like, take the first album, add more melodic color and solo sections, but also add the album solace and try to copy that Mm -hmm. to death metal Mm -hmm. because that album is wicked. It's literally insane. I mean, that album is that band is one of the most underrated bands. Like they just kind of were a little blip. They were kind of willow tip in the beginning. I mean, yeah, so I think they released something Solace. in 2017. I hope they have a new thing brewing. Solace I is like one it. of those albums that's like a Chaos Fear production too. It has that gritty production. The dude but that uh, did Whisper Supremacy that. did that album. Was that uh, produced? The guy who produced Whisper Supremacy produced Solace. Oh, I didn't know that. that and was he was gonna do. He was gonna produce. Once was not, or once was lost, or and he lost, not, and he yeah. did uh, Solace instead. That was the one with Lord Worm, the Return of Lord Worm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I, that I album mean, was I, actually I, talked about cool in Rolling song. Stone. <laughs> was that? Solace was actually talked about in a little paragraph in Rolling Stone. And oh, it was wow. a pretty good little blurb of like throughout the chaos and what may seem as something that's not fun to listen to, they actually bring you in with, like you were saying, themes and they bring back a riff. And yeah intentional songwriting was uh, always part of their things they always had the feel changes too they would they'd introduce, drummer. they'd introduce a beat and then they'd bring that beat back with a six eight feel they played in four and then played in six and it was just like oh man that that, that drummer rust, reminds me that of rustles Keith. my jimmies right there that got me good <laughs> we always used to say anomalous or tim if tim and max used to say crypt gore shuga was uh, you beat me to it <laughs> yeah. crypt, so cryptopsy gore guts mashuga just smashed in but uh tim's got some gore gutsy vocals on i think at least the first one i was i was getting some hints of luke lemay in, in his voice and you know when i joined an oh, album, yeah. there, there was no but- singer obscura for the listeners there was no singer in in mind when i joined anomalous we didn't have the ep out or anything it was just them playing guitar from what i know uh i don't think i ever thought about vocals ever so when i first heard tim scream i went yeah that's the anomalous scream right there it it just seemed exactly right for the anomalous sound it was a yell it it was growl sometimes but it was the majority of that mid-range yell i mean i'll I'll just i'll just cut to the chase it's trying to be mashuga <laughs> yeah, i mean but tim, tim tim also is one of you know, mashuga nut who agrees that it's one of the greatest groupings of people to make music with guitars um, really is. i'm surprised not every episode mashuga gets mentioned because <laughs> mashuga should be a thing that gets mentioned every goddamn second of the day as far as i'm concerned <laughs> When you're eating your breakfast, you should. Did you listen to my sugar today? No, I didn't. Yeah, you know. my but I'm eating. Sp- but I'm eating my sugar today. <laughs> I mean, I saw my sugar open for Tool at Aftershock, and they upstaged Tool with no visuals, like I said, and fucking, they're just the shit. And yeah, so Tim was imitating Yens, I guess, for my sugar, But I think, and then also- you know, gotta have death metal vocals too. So yeah, so Corpse Grinder, he had those lows too. 
But as soon as I heard it, I just, it fits so well with Tim also is what introduced programming drums to anomalous. That was going to be well, where I wanted to go with it. Like which is doing that part. It made the album, I think too, before it was, what are we going to find a drummer? And then when we started hearing Tim program, we'd get 30 seconds at a time, 40 seconds. And I remember building eight for the first time and just yep, hearing metastasize. Yeah. You're hearing metastasize be built with program drums and just hearing how crazy those drums were and saying, this is about to be a really cool album that I can't wait to be a part of. And it made it feel like amazing that. to rehearse with it. He'd bring over just a drum track. So I'd start playing. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm hearing the song for the first time, how it's supposed to be played. And it yeah, was a uh, feeling, dude. That's such yeah. A it was, it was awesome. a, I mean, programming drums for a band that can't find a drummer to play that stuff was a chance to actually make music. Uh, without it, you're I, I, only people going into the room to see Max and Tim play were able to see how sick that stuff was, as far as I'm concerned. So those program drums made it a project. Now we have a, we have songs, and as far as I'm concerned, when I joined the project at that point, I was a, a student of anomalies. I. I had no contributions for cognitive dissonance other than, bro, you guys are sick at guitar and I need to learn that. That's that's all it was. Learning, 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 learning. I'm still there today. Uh, Omnivalent was the first time I got a chance to do anything with the band yeah. at all. And I think because that was... Because Tim put the guitar down. Yeah. And, and that was because we started saying, we're going to play live for cognitive dissonance. We released the album. It was be being received really well. I, I got in contact with Marco to start playing live at that point. And uh, we started rehearsing and what we couldn't have was a different vocalist because uh, uh, Tim was the sound of anomalous for screaming as far as I'm concerned, but vocals mean something to me for death metal still. Uh, they always did. So Max saying skin to liquid, no vocals. I was a death metal guy. I, it was like, I like death metal. I love this shit. So I know vocalists that I like, and I had ones that I didn't like. So I needed Tim's voice on that. And I think it was necessary. So in order You're to do well that, first in metal. So yeah, I, I started listening to metal. I was like four. Well, I mean, so skin, skin to liquid had the same effect on me, but it also ushered me into un, uh, accepting death metal vocals because I, I, I basically because yeah. now I like the Cannibal Corpse song. So it's like. Yeah. Exactly, and it came at the. I used to have that, like I said earlier, that uh, live cannibalism DVD, and we would like watch it and stuff. Or uh, wasn't it? It was a VHS. I would we'd watch it at like after high school and stuff. Me and Carrie just like, all right, well, this is cool. Like, there's some cool parts to it. And then that the credits came on, and that would be from Skin to Liquid, and we would just be yeah. like, damn, what the fuck is this? Like, yeah, we we both got like obsessed with that song, and that slowly. And then there was like a band. It's a kind of a random band, but this band, Garden of Shadows, from uh, actually the bass player. Uh, Sean Beasley from uh, Dying Fetus is on in that band, actually, which I found out like fucking a year ago. And I was messaging him about it. I'm like, you were in that band? Like, because it was kind of this melodic, kind of super like melodic, slow, dark, uh, death metal at the gates band kind of thing. But those vocals like translated to me because they weren't just like it was it had at the gates feel to it with melodic stuff behind it. And then the the growls made sense to me. And then I was like, all right now i love this so it kind of then the mixture of from skin to liquid and that i was like okay now i'm ready like i'm you know, in the beginning of like the growling and stuff it's like my brother was he was you know listening to it when i was in 92 93 like blasting death metal when i was a kid and my dad and i my dad who's a musician would whisper into my ear this shit sucks like fuck this <laughs> like you know and like i my dad was my like hero you know so i was just like yeah this shit sucks like fuck this and then uh Later, he's got to come to my fucking death metal shows when we're touring and like sit there and like nod his head with our shirt on, going, like, Yeah, this is cool. Like, this. So <laughs> it <all sucks>. it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I remember when we got at the gates, at the gates vocally. I mean, I remember being a little kid and rewinding the way he would scream, Slaughter of the Soul, suicidal, just the way he yep. would scream that. No, totally. It's so vicious and i would just repeat that and say man that singer is the shit so vocals for death metal were big for me so tim needed to do it and live it was i i played guitar before i played bass i played bass just so i can play in anomalous honestly i would never have played bass otherwise i am not a bass player 
but I was a fan of Max and Tim's guitar playing enough to say I'm a bass player now because that shit is sick. And I heard demos of Max and Tim that he's talking about, and I heard those and said, this is not sick. I said, <laughs> these are not the demos. <laughs> so when I saw them play like that, I went, whoa, something happened, and you guys went into warp speed because this shit is fucking miles different, and I need to join it. So we, we needed to play live, and I said, well, I can play guitar, and I can keep up with the guitar parts for that. So we started rehearsing to play live with the program drums, waiting for Marco to be able to come in and start playing with us. And I think we rehearsed with Marco twice as a full band with Tim and backing vocals. And we were like, we're going to start playing live. And Marco said, I'm joining brain drill and going on tour we went sick. And that was it. That was the end of, going to play live with Marco on cognitive dissonance because he was kind of just gone touring after that. So we could blame and, Marco. <laughs> no, because Marco, Marco did Marco, but finding John also lived back, super far away. Yeah. He lived in Oregon, I think at the time, Portland. So that's right. He would have to come down and do it. So sometimes he'd be in San Jose where he used to live, I guess. But <laughs> back then I feel like extreme metal drummers, were a dime a dozen. Like seeing Casey Howard for the first time, I, I think I said it last time, was like, they got a guy who can do it. Oh my <laughs> God, it's, it's not just Tim Young in 50 bands. They got a guy who can do it, you know? And I remember the video with the fan, you know, the hair going oh, everywhere. Yeah. I'm like, damn, this guy's mm -hmm. ripping that shit up, you know? So, Dudley. I think yeah, so. exactly. Still to this day, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> Those <laughs> videos even up still? I was, I think yeah. I was like filming it or something. Yeah. I think. Oh, really? Yeah. I was like. You got the in-person fanning. No, it was in, it was insane. Like it was. I mean, I still remember Casey's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna try out for Decrepit," and I was like, "All right." I mean, it sounds insane, possible, but if yeah. you can, if you think you can do it, fucking let's let's check it out. And I remember. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like I remember just like fucking watching Casey did a couple songs, and then it was like Decrepit, like it was like Bill and Matt and Risha, just fucking like played like eighty percent of "And Time Begins" with a drum machine in the room that was probably. 10 by 10 it was like the song not the small. album super small yeah and like seven and just, foot ceilings yeah and then <clears> just like they just play it was like them facing me and then they just played through and time begins pretty much and i was just like <laughs> I, I walked out of there like i was on mushrooms like my pupils were huge and i was like what the fuck was I that mean, i was talking like, about it before wrong, but... guys but yeah the first show that you played was with cryptopsy at the pound was that the the first show you played with the Crevet Casey? Oh no, no, that was that's um, L.A. right? Well, we we played like house parties and stuff like at the Thunderdome. Yeah, okay. I think that was the first actual show, was it? Like, because you opened that show uh, before uh, Polarity was released, right? That's the second. Yeah, album. But diminishing, the first, diminishing, diminishing. The first diminishing. actual show we did was. Diminishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first, yeah, definitely. It was like 2005. We played uh, uh, at Brick by Brick in San Diego. Oh. We did the show with Discourage and it was going to be Deeds headlining. And then that's oh. that's the one there where Mike and Jacoby like fell off a balcony and oh, Mike shit. like broke his arm or something like that. Um, dude, and, pizza flesh shows are cursed. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Always so, have that's, problems. That's, guns being brought in. Uh, oh, at Broadway man. Studios, there was a fight. Our singer got into a fight at that show. Oh, you're right. Huh? Uh, the pound Jacoby got hit in the face. There are a lot oh, of yeah. other stories too. It's true. Yeah, you're right, man. Crazy. Yeah, that um, was uh yeah. Someone got punched. In, that was the end of the bloodletting tour. Yeah. yeah. Did you yeah. did you guys ever ask Casey to join Anomalous or anything? No. Okay. I don't think we did. Uh, okay. There was a name that circulated, but not as like someone to try out. We're just like we need to try and be like them. <laughs> yeah, I, I think for us, for drummers, it was really hard. What was, what we found was we'd find some drummers that could blast beat and play fast, but they couldn't do Meshuggah stuff. It okay. Was, mm -hmm. like, Marco, but, but I Marco can't play could. that stuff anyways. Not really. That's not the craziest stuff. thing is Marco is from drum corps, like mm -hmm. in college and high school. And uh, maybe that's the stuff that helped his brain be able to play Meshuggah-like riffs. And I, yeah. I tried to pick his brain and it was like a brick wall. He's like, I don't know. And uh, even with that being said, though, I can remember him playing our songs and me and Tim are like, 
oh, that's mm-hmm. great, dude, that's great. But like that part and that part and that part and that part, you gotta, you gotta do it again. Yep. And it was, it's weird because it's like, that's me and Tim and we can't help our being like that because I mean, it was we've, already heard, we've already heard the program drums. This is the dream. That's exactly yeah. how it needs to be played. So, mm-hmm. so, so, so Marco posted videos of him playing on V drums, right? And I think all of us were, we, we were in perfect. the same boat. Like we never rehearsed with him when he made those videos and we would watch it and go like, wow, he got 85% there, you know, he got, he got 85%. So if we can bring him in for 15%, that's going to tie it in and we're going to be able to do this. And the idea of playing live was a reality that we were hopefully going to see and do it. And it just didn't work out, I think, but we still signed this brutal brand band contract. And also Max and Tim already had stems of other songs when I joined the band. So at that point, uh, cognitive dissonance, I would call it eight, nine, 10 and revelations. So uh, I don't know the actual song title names because I didn't write the lyrics or the song titles. But uh, this our full length album has 11, 12 and 13. Those were stems already written that they had. So this was walking into a writing session of Anomalous and it was crazy. Just the, the riffs were crazier in those songs because Max and Tim just got better at guitar by the, to that time. So the riffs were crazier in general. And I think at that time, me writing for the band became out of necessity because we're like, we need to finish this album. I, I don't even know if I would have been invited to write for Anomalous at all if we didn't have to release an album. Uh, personally, I don't think. Maybe Max could say different, yeah. but honestly, I'll just, that's... I'll I just say... That, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Finish up. No, that's it. I'm done. I'm eight years old in Master Club. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll just say Omnivalent to me is is like the apex of tech death, dude. Like progressive metal. It's like still the best one, man. Thanks, man. It's still, yeah. It's it's like I like other albums from other bands and enough to make me question what's my favorite if I can even have like a favorite album. But like for that, the same kind of progressive shred music where that's combining with death metal i think you guys did it better than anyone has ever done it on that album it's the fucking best dude. Thanks, man. Yeah. what year did that come out again 2011 2011 oh, okay yeah and and i just have listened to it like for 10 years now dude and like every time i have a chance it's like with joel and spawn of possession I was like you guys heard of anomalous dude like dude i, I tell you man like the yeah support. i mean yeah. i feel like the album got a great response throughout all these years we still get it brought up to us so I'm yeah. glad we we did something that people like and, and it's it's a for, it's a like, cult album among tech death yeah. nerds is what it is. It's like <laughs> it's like uh you know like uh you know I've brought it up before and it's the only thing I can think of but uh it's like the, you know the Big Lebowski coming out and like no one saw it when it came out but like after the fact it it became like this cult underground like once the the scene kind of developed and the the tech death stuff started to develop more and more bands started mm-hmm. coming out people could be like like joseph just be like have you fucking heard this you know like do you oh, i felt any... super cool every time i oh yeah and people would be like no <laughs> and you'd be like well yeah, this will blow your mind man well, <laughs> yeah. like you guys were saying before when you listen to death metal and technical stuff and you listen to like the musicians music mm-hmm. that's what we were shooting for for sure with uh it got to a point like nate was saying where we gave up thinking about playing live and not to get too personal, but like things were rocky and weird in my life. My mom was sick and stuff like that. And you start pouring everything into the musical project and you start, mm-hmm. you start shooting for the craziest idea without, you know, worrying about how it's going to turn out. And it, yeah, as an artist, cause you know, I'm a guitar player. I'm also an artist. I went to an art high school. There's like this pinky in the air part of me that, you know, loves like Nate was saying David Lynch and oh yeah abstract painting and when you shoot for that kind of stuff you can make some pretty awesome stuff when you don't worry about like song structure or how long a song is or but know. on the other side of that like it's there's a chance you end up into like just total improv and then you lose the ability to like play tech death because it's like has to be played with other people and you have to lock in so how did you like is it having another person that like kept you grounded well, here's what's funny. Tim, going back to Tim and giving him 
at least this third credit for everything that has happened up until this point. Mm-hmm. He, he said this before too. Like, can you imagine if I never showed you metal, you'd be like touring playing blues or something. And uh, cause so many times in my musical experience, what I was doing when Tim wasn't at my house was shredding uh, blue stuff, running scales. I got into Joe Satriani and, you know, getting into more legato shredding and the picking thing is always a pain in the ass and looking for guitar players. You, you discover Ingwe Malmsteen and Vinnie Moore, Jason Becker, uh, Marty Friedman and Greg Howe. And you're like, Oh, I need to go back and get better again. But then none of that has anything to do with like crazy riffs and blast beats and kick and dissonance and screaming. So mm-hmm. he would always take all this technical stuff I'm learning and apply it to something that seemed to make more sense than like, no offense to anyone who's ever written like a corny song for their shredding. But that was always the thing. Tim was like, that guy's so awesome, but look at that song. You know, it's like, you know, a little backing track in E minor. What about, yeah. what if that was over on? Yeah. So, uh, and then you start hearing other bands do that too. And you're like, Oh, it's starting to happen. Like, or they already did it and you're just discovering them. And now, I mean, this, this right here was also like, what the fuck is yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, that was a turning point album for me. I don't too. even know if you could call this death metal. This is something special. Again, yeah, Gorgas <laughs> Obscura for the listeners. Piece of art. It's like Earthly Love, track two. And the, I'm getting chills right now. And the song mm-hmm. breaks down into this like ghost ship. I see, I see like a blue ghost pirate ship with ghosts on it. And it, all of a sudden there's a violin riff. And it sounds like, like a, a ghost train is coming. And, and you're just like, I'm listening to art right now. I don't yep. know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know what this is. And it's, but for some reason they are a metal band with kick and they have, you know, an album that came out before it, but then Luke LeMay goes to college and then writes this thing. And a, yeah. a credit to big Steve too, the other guitar player. Cause he was part of that sound as well, where it's just, it's nasty. It's gross, but it's focused and, I, mean, I don't know if you guys know the drummer that recorded this is not the original drummer. He was mm. some like session jazz drummer. Yeah, that they oh, had wow. learned to play kick. But the old drummer wrote everything that dude played. So wow. th- that's so just, one of those albums that you really see like, oh, you can be really creative and weird in death metal still. Death metal doesn't have to sit in a box. You can do some weird shit with it. And yeah. Well, Gore Guts was a death metal band that did that. And I feel like we also listened to, you know, Dillinger and the hard, more like hardcore, I felt like was, they were more free to explore. It felt like that, that scene kind of accepted. Calculating, man. Yeah. Like calculating affinity. When that got introduced to me, my brother said, this is hardcore music. It's weird. They do weird shit. See if you like it. And I, I loved it. I was like, oh, there's, I, there's bizarre stuff I want to listen to. Death metal by that time felt kind of straight was, and Gorguts is still straight, but it's so weird in its vibes that it, it's so cool. And Gorguts is still one of my favorite bands to this day. I love Gorguts. I'm happy they're still releasing music too. I got to give props to the Venerucci's. John, Nate's older brother, took, uh, took me to shows, like brought me under his wing because he's like, okay, you can play guitar. You like metal. Let's go see some metal. You got to see the real stuff. And me and Tim are writing stuff thinking we're sick. And he brings us to Dying Fetus, Gorguts, Origin, and Cryptopsy. <laughs> Jesus. And, <laughs> and when we saw Gorguts, too, I mean, we saw Dying Fetus and Gorguts. It might have even been the same show. I don't know. Is it the Cactus Club or Cactus Pit? Cactus, Cactus Club. Club. So small. And we're just like, what the fuck? We need yeah. to get better and learn sweeps, obviously, because Dying Fetus is owning the show and then this weird avant-garde death metal band comes out and just that that was a very special thing because i've never that's heard the record they were that's the record they were supporting on that tour. no it's from wisdom to hate but they played like half of this album which is still yeah, a fucking killer album. there isn't there isn't a bad gorguts album i love all of them yeah they're all their own thing and it's, i love them all it's all very specific like none of it is like on accident that's what's cool. It's like it sounds like this, and it was planned. It was orchestrated to sound like that. They've Plus, they never have a repeated wicked... an album. They've never repeated a style on it. Every album's a different new step 
or new version of Gorgas. And this album and From Wisdom to Hate both have that classic last track instrumental. You know, yeah. Sweet Silence mm -hmm. is yeah. the one on this. And I forget the, the one on From Wisdom, but it's it's dope. So it's yeah, always yeah. like, you know, they gave me another thing to chug that didn't have vocals. Not that I don't like the vocals, but you can focus on the guitars because I want to hear the guitars. Yeah. <laughs> Was that the tour with Kevin Talley on drums with Dying Fetus? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that tour at the Whiskey in L.A. <laughs> His headphones on and he's blast beating like. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, you you brought up Dying Fetus with the Sweeps. I will say that was the band that I would credit for Sweeps too, and it was Killing on Adrenaline. I feel like that that Dude, sure they were uh, doing that. Uh, how did a four string bass player keep up with the six string guitars? I remember he's like doing these sweeps. I'm like, but he's he's got to play something different because he's doesn't have two strings. What is he doing? How are they doing this? And Origin too is the same kind of thing. Both, you know, oh. doing those sweeps. Yeah, yeah Mike oh, Flores. Okay. Mike yeah, Flores Mike. is the the way that. Yeah, I remember seeing Mike. I remember seeing Mike Flores for the first time when like actually watching him jam with the uh, like that little like finger style he does where he's just like twitching and he's like, like two oh. hammers. Yeah, yeah. It's just constant, <laughs> just going like this, and then you do this one with one finger, middle finger, you just be like this, like a picking finger. You like use it as yeah. a pick, and I'd just be like, what the fuck is that? psycho doing dude. that's insane i've never seen anyone do that gotta give props to paul being a part of this like bay area thing because i never thought i'd become friends with someone that i was kind of starstruck by and he worked at guitar center and it was like i remember once i knew who he was i'd like go and try and shred and like turn it up a little bit or like hey i need quite like a question about this axe and he'd like hear me play and be like cool <laughs> 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 like super long goatee yeah yeah but then it like it became we became friends kind of and all of a sudden we're going to shows at the pound and i saw cannibal corpse with him at slims and the, the funny story with that that's the show i wish there was a video of it we're at the bar you remember where the bar was in the back mm -hmm. and i gave the bartender my credit card and i was like having red bull vodkas and getting just like I, I maybe i didn't like who was opening or something but I, I drank my last drink i was like paul i'm going in and i just ran into through the pit <laughs> and i don't remember after that oh, no. and I'm, I'm a big dude and i was crowd surfing for the entire show oh, no. i jumped off the stage like 10 times corpse grinder was like Can someone get this fucker out of here <laughs> like i kept landing on the stage and like bumping into him i guess the only memories I have is like looking into the crowd, like grabbing them, like, I don't want to get kicked out. Pull me back. <laughs> and, then, and then like blacking out and doing it all over again. And time uh, traveling. Good times. And then I'm like sobering up and they're playing Hammer Smash Face because that's the last song. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so back. Max actually had a question for you. It's the one question I was thinking of before coming onto this podcast was, um, you used to have those videos on YouTube. That that's how I found out about you. Was those videos, those like shred videos on YouTube with you with your 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 Les Paul, and I was that's like, an old video. Yeah, yeah, no, it was old. It was definitely like it was old. It was like from two thousand two. Wow. Yeah, yeah. There were, I might have not I even my seen it on you. It might have not even been on YouTube. It might have been just circulated around. Well, on YouTube was it around. En it ended now. up on YouTube. Yeah, it sucks. That's from a whole show. That's one of two shows that we played. No, it was you just sitting down, like in your, like sitting down in shreds. Well, the one with me sitting down is with the black Ibanez. I, I remember, I, I have a, a. The Les Paul video was the live video, and we cut a okay. section that was just a solo section, and we put it on our MySpace. Oh, okay. So I'm mixing it's it up. It's the solo okay. section for the Seraphim Veil that we okay. took that for. It. Played from the old version of that song back yeah. in the day when it was called Number Seven. And that was a okay. show that uh, Anomalous played before I was in the band with the drummer Steve, where there was no vocals. It was just Max and Tim on guitar, Steve on drums, and uh, they Solo Thunder opened for you guys, right? It reminded me of those videos of Dillinger playing under the running board before Calculating came out, when they're playing on floor level. And people are like choking out the guitar player. Oh, yeah, I've seen that shit. Yeah, yeah. You're like, this is savage energy. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, the crowd is attacking them. <laughs> no, we. Have, I just remember videos of you. I mean, I have envisioned the the Les Paul, but maybe I'm mixing up the live one with you. Just I remember you just sitting and shredding. Like I was showing it to people. Like this guy is like anomalous or something. Like 
like showing it to people like watching your shred just be like holy who the fuck is this guy you know like completely like it's one of those moments that you were talking about where you see like where nate met you and was just like oh shit dude this guy just murders us dude we gotta we gotta step up our fucking game dude this this well it's funny i'm I'm max playing and uh, sorry sorry to suck your dick here real quick again max but uh, the thing about max is playing that always astounded me was uh, Max plays with soul, whether he's playing death metal or playing blues. And I noticed that. And I, I, I remember one of the conversations early I had with Max was what, what are some of the things you practiced on guitar? And he said, you know, some days I would just practice hitting one note and seeing what I can do with that note and seeing how I can bend that note and seeing what tone I can get out of the note. And it's, I won't even move from that note. And you can hear that in Max's playing. When he plays, he has control over those strings to the point where his bends are so fluid and intentional. And it, it's it's the soul of Max. And Ma- Max also, I'll, he's on ontogeny albums because every time I can give him a guitar to play something, I'm giving it to him because I love watching Max play guitar. I will cancel all solo sections I have on an album to give it to Max every single time because... He's my favorite guitar player and he can play a solo instantly too. You give him a section, say, here's a guitar and he'll play the sickest solo you ever heard and say, that's, that's it. That's the take. I would, that would take me a while to get something not good. And you did it just playing and it had soul. So soul is Max's playing to me. And, and I hope people watching his live stream Twitch videos now can have that same feeling I have still. Cause it's, it's magic in Max's fingers. So Max's room resurrected. resurrected. So how much, I mean, how I percentage wise discipline, I mean, dude, to hang on one note all day, that's a, that's a disciplinary thing for now, sure. I mean, bro. you break it up into chapters where you do that for 10 minutes, half an hour, but then you, you, you integrate it with, I mean, like I was saying before, my dad would make me practice sight reading and scales before I could throw on an album and solo to it. And of course, as I got older, that happened less and less just because I'm spoiled. And I'm like, I just want to do the stuff I want to do. But I think I got that, that treatment early enough to have footing. So, uh, I mean, I got to hand it to being obsessed with Steve Ray Vaughan and David Gilmore. Because it's all about bends. You know, David Gilmore is known for bending notes in a certain way, like slow blues licks. Yep. Steve Ray Vaughn, I was like, oh, damn, that's fire. That's fast. You know, I mean, he could play slow too. But so learning vibrato and how to squeeze a note out, and stank. That's and then, the note, man. That's but, what it- but, then, but then, you know, you hear Satriani and you're like, whoa, legato. Like shredding three notes on a string and flew it up and down you combine shredding with tone and then you end up with something kind of cool i mean shredding is cool but whenever you've heard a player that just plays fast and then they hit one note and it's like ah like oh man just keep playing fast mm-hmm. so yeah I, don't I, know. I feel like that's what i notice in a lot uh, of playing is the soul wasn't there, but the fast, the chops was always there. I mean, I, I don't have, I'm not a good soloist in my eyes either. Matt Max is always what I've seen as a good soloist too. I'm in the, I can call any album I make from here on out in the shadows of Max and it would work because that he's always going to be like, um, that's a level above every time, every time. And it's a level of thinking that I could never have to the way Max thinks about music is unique as well and what what we share nate is being obsessed with the guitar from a young age and i grew up listening to my dad practice scales in the other room in, on a saxophone and if you hear us like a good average saxophone player they generally have more vibrato in their just playing of scales than a guitar player might you know what i mean it's a breath there's yeah. uh, it's like singing yeah. So uh, you're learning Cannibal Corpse, and I'm learning vibrato. You know, yeah. at, I mean, at I, these young ages. I feel like so. me, young age for me, Mashuga is what really did it. Still, and they still do it now. And it was rhythmic because I played drums too. So drums and rhythmic stuff. Mashuga was what caught my ear more than anything. I didn't hear shred music until Max, though. That being said, okay. You know what I was practicing in middle school? 
Shine On You Crazy Diamond and Comfortably Numb, note for note, the solos. Yeah. Specifically. Yeah. So I would be able to play that whole long, slow, atmospheric thing to Shine On You Crazy Diamond. That was my everything. It's the coolest that thing comfort- I'd ever that heard. Comfortably Numb solo, man, That that's, I mean, to hit that thing, perfect. I mean, it's like hitting the notes and stuff is like, it's, you know, obviously doable, but like getting that soul out of it or like even watching... David Gilmore do it live where he kind of improvises a little bit and goes like into a different, he still has it. Like he still has this like floating away. Like he does more. That's what I always said about. And I'm sure it's like what music teachers probably say. It's like, he does more with like 10 notes that like a shredder will do with a a thousand. You know what I mean? Like he just brings you to a, a different universe. Like you see the landscape, you see what, you know, what he's presenting to you. And it's, you know, through the music. So that's definitely like, what David Gilmore has given, you know, a lot of like you're yourself, like uh, given those musicians like that feel that most people are missing now, you know, nowadays or forever days ago, like he's like pretty much in my top three or top four Mount Rushmore of guitar players is David Gilmore for sure. Yeah. So, and then, you know, dime bag. So it's like, yeah, he's there too. Yeah, That dude, that dude can shred, but it's like the shred is only ever going to be like 50% of his playing at the most. That other 50% is a mastery of the damn instrument. The squeals, the whammy bar is an extension of himself. The vibrato. vibrato. He's the only guitar player that would bend a note so much. And I don't really like players that like really bend the note too far. But he's mm. like, it's just his taste. I trust what he's doing. You know, if you notice like the last note of uh, this love, and it's, it starts out all the way down and it just comes all the way up to this perfect singing note. Yeah. It just don't make me cry, man. I Is mean, that something that uh, Gilmore would do too? Because I kind of feel like, you know, listening to Gilmore stuff that he would he would start on a bend up and come yeah. down. Yeah, that's okay, the yeah, trick. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for, for anyone listening, you guys too, go check out the solo on Not Now John. It's uh, on the final cut after the wall. It's the mm-hmm. only like really rocking song on the album the rest is just kind of weird roger waters depressing i'm ending the band music <laughs> but that but that song is just like your basic pink floyd jam and his whammy bar work is like more intense than it was on the wall and it's it's sick it's oh, yeah it's shreddy <laughs> yeah so add this i'm putting this kind of music into my ears and then i'm starting to listen to shred and there were pivotal moments like ingwe malmstein of course you're like, whoa, look what that dude's doing with a strap. <laughs> look mm. at the scooped fretboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scallop uh, fretboard. Yeah. I still want one. But uh Paul Gilbert, he taught me because he came over to my house and he not. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> no, but he's got a he's you know, have you ever seen his videos from back in the day oh, where yeah. he's like dressed up and it's hilarious? Totally. I love that dude's sense of humor. But on one of them, just to get started, it's like three notes on one string, upstroke on the next string. So it's like da 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 you can't like blow your mind in other people's minds with improv a, unless you're like perfectly well-versed in every technique sweeps your legato, your melodic playing. If you're like thinking too hard, you're not going to play any notes. (laughs) And this Mm -hmm. dude would write these epic classical solos over this bomb death metal I'm listening to. And, uh, Two things happened in my musical metal experience too. Before I really heard, we heard New Millennium Cyanide Christ, just that song, but we didn't have the album. So we just circulated that song for like a whole summer. And then I went to my my family's house in Olympia for a whole month by myself. I would discover stuff. And my cousin just randomly downloaded a, it's called the Contradictions Collapse Medley. So it's all the solos compiled. Okay. And I never heard that album before. So I just, you get to hear all the solos back to back. And the same thing we found with uh, Cryptopsy solos, where it was like all the solos just kind of pasted together. And I was like, oh, I didn't know these solos were in these dense songs. So uh, I was like, I need to start playing better. (laughs) 
that was kind of like getting away from the soul stuff, obviously. Yeah. But I guess it's stained. It's like ingrained in me enough that it just comes out, which is sweet because it's my favorite way to play. Shred Definitely. is fun. Shred is fun, but if you can like land on that singing note, it makes yeah. it's like the, per- the period at the end of the sentence. And that's why I love Sean Lane too. But uh, it's like, well, you bring up like, uh, you know, it's just, I'm kind of in the same wheelhouse of like listening to, because my dad was all about, you know, Satriani, Vi, um, all those guys. And they kind of had like, one thing that always kind of bummed me out and, and they, you know, there's songs that are exceptions for sure, but they definitely, their song, the song writing was like, kind of like this dad kind of like, it was never yeah. like, it was just kind of like this like wanky kind of like thing. And I was like, I'd always think to my, in my head, like, dude, like you guys are like the, the shredders of our time, you know, pretty much. And like, why not like take that and like do something like cool and like take us into a mood and do like rather than just be like all like bam, 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 like all like, oh, like exactly. fucking like slappy and just all like like fun like that's just but it's still like you know when every song starts turning out like that you're like he's like oh I'm gonna use synth on this album so it's like it still doesn't <laughs> yeah. have like doesn't have like a vibe to it except like okay it's saturating wanting to solo over something different like it was never like I mean they have he has his songs that have you know that actually have the full song like means something and it has a beginning and end, middle end and all that stuff. Yeah. And a lot of it turned into like kind of just like this wank fest where it wasn't really didn't really like the song didn't talk to me at all. It was just yeah. like, no, you got to cert- when you have to sift through like 10 albums of wanky music and maybe there's like five out of those 10 albums yep. and it might be the last track. It might be the middle track. It might only be like half of a song in yep. the middle of an album. It's hard to kind of chug all of that when you're like, I want to chug the new, Cryptopsy album or the new, yeah, you know, like that's where I didn't get into shred music for so long. It's, yeah, like yeah. I, I was, I was into. Okay, so Slipknot came out in 1999. I graduated high school in 2000. Mm-hmm. The only album that I can say was like bridging the gap for me. It was Obsolete, Fear Factory. Oh yeah, me too. I heard, Fuck I heard that. Shock, and I was like, Oh me too. Ooh. And Edge Crusher <laughs> and shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But but specifically, I would just play Shock over and over and over. Yeah. There was another song on that. Actually, that got you? That's interesting. D Manufacturer is what got you. D Manufacturer. Tim Tim was listening to Pantera and D Manufacturer, and I wasn't I wasn't into like the the uh, like Pantera's got some riffs that are like punky and like Mm -hmm. like the the snare is kind of like almost heading towards a blast beat. Yeah. Kind of like the way DEI is like a lot of punk stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. Like on vulgar but, and shit. But I just I liked shock because I was a sucker for like the corn riffs and and slip. That comes that comes in hard though with that like as that like synth beginning. It's all yeah. You know, I remember like hearing that too and being like, well, actually, that's I mean, I went backwards, so it was obsolete for me. And then like, because I was all about the seven string thing. The seven string thing was like the I had like my Ibanez catalog that had like. <laughs> pictures of like dino and like uh head monkey and like had like the guy from orgy in it and like west borland and like you know from like 2001 or something i would just sit and just just stare at it all day like i need that that guitar is going to solve all my problems this is what this <laughs> yeah. is, i just need this guitar you know solve but, yeah, uh, my problems yeah yeah I exactly i've been a seven string uh that i started playing seven string when i was 10 years old damn uh, so I, I've been an extended range player almost specifically the entire so time. You, got a, you had a universe then, right? I did not. I had the first RG seven strings that they made Ibanez. It was, uh, they were awesome Ibanez's actually. I just, I've sold all of my guitars that I used to have. I've sold every single Me guitar too. that I have and bought a whole new lineup of guitars. Uh, and I kind of wish I kept that one, I guess, because it recorded all of my old shit and it was my first seven string i guess but those first range of ibanez rg guitars were super high end now the years after that they started making really cheaper ibanez mm-hmm. rg but max actually has a cheap ibanez rg that sounds great and plays great it's the one that paul from origin sold me for under price yeah. and got in trouble yeah and uh, <laughs> i play and i know you can't even see if i play an ibanez Prestige now. This is what I play now. The Ibanez Prestige. Oh, uh, that's awesome, man. The, the bare knuckles. Is that the bare knuckles? The bare knuckles, yeah. Strandberg guitars too. I play keys, little guitars. So, so a uh, so Nate, since you said Strandberg, since you know a lot of people ask about gear and stuff, I want to know about gear. So, um, you know, I know the I noticed the Strandberg when I watched you know um 
Paul Masvidal play for Cynic, and I was standing behind him, kind of like I was like kind of like parallel, but like behind him. And I looked at the neck, and I noticed the neck was starting kind of high, and, and like it kind of like it, it follows bevels. your thumb down, right? Yeah, it bevels really weird here. All the time. So is that is that good or bad for you? Do you? Do you... Uh, it depends. I, I'll show you. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, it's like this weird neck, and all the Strandbergs are the same with it. They have like this. So I got this Strandberg yeah, here. Yeah, that's sick. It's a that's Burl, Burl Strandberg, super sweet. So I yeah. don't know if you can see the neck on it. You have to, yeah, yeah, you can see Ew. it going, going diagonal. It's yeah, diagonal. See that, that, this like center area. Oh yeah. my gosh. That direction. And I'll say, as far as the way wow. my hand sits on it, it's super comfortable, except when I play specific. Ontogeny rips, because uh, <laughs> some of the chords I write are like, like that. Yeah, and yeah. It's a, it's a fan fret, so because of that, now my pinky has to go an extra little bit, and my index finger has to go an extra bit. This is an actual. That's a chord that I have to play, and when I play it, I have to move it like this throughout. So oh, on this. The, this guitar, it's super hard, but the Ibanez, it's way easy. But yeah. shredding on this guitar is way easier. Because the fan fret just, I don't know, it's just more comfortable for shredding. I'd say the sound of this guitar is why I like it. The, these uh, Fluence, the Fishman yeah, Fluence cool. pickups are fucking awesome. My wife bought me this guitar for my anniversary. I was like, that's a pretty good anniversary gift. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she's what got a good mean? track record of anniversary gifts. She bought me like, a Kiesel and then she bought me this. So. Okay. Yeah. Pretty good one. <laughs> I just wanted to chime in. I remember going to lessons at Casey's house when I was his music student and there was a seven string Ibanez. Uh, actually, I don't know if it was an Ibanez, but it was a seven string on the wall there. Like, I think it was it a white. Mine. And I was, oh, was going to say, was it yours, Joel? No, mine was living black. there. Oh, maybe it was yeah. black. I yeah. don't really remember the color. I had it back then. I had it back then. That yeah, was the Joel. original one that I bought in like 1999. Yeah. You had like, that when I met you. Like, I feel yeah, like yeah. a seven string is a it's a perfect amount of strings. I don't know that that low note lets you tie in bass notes that are really cool. You can keep your, your six string in standard basically and have an extra drop low note. So I can play the drop tuning stuff uh, with my low seven string, but still have a six string tuning on the standard side. Even my, I just bought this guy. It's a seven string acoustic. I have an nice. too, so oh, shit. Uh, oh, cool. Playing an acoustic cool. seven strings rad now I, i'm super yeah. excited to start incorporating that into the next albums and stuff so That's seven dope. strings i feel like are comfortable eight strings i have a couple eight strings and that's like the borderline of starting to get uncomfortable for me as far as like i can deal with an eight string yeah. because i like the sound of it and i like the tone and i like what you can make with it as far as comfortability, I don't think eight strings are comfortable for me. I, it's very <clears> odd <throat> every time I play an eight string. Yeah, I was, a, I was. I'm a six string player, and I went to go buy a, a cabinet. This guy had like a bunch of Mesa Boogie cabinets he was selling, and I was like just down the street from me. So I went over, and I was. He's like, "You want to test it out?" I'm like, "Okay, sure." And just handed me an eight string, and I was like, uh, "Like I was like, <laughs> like I don't know what to play. like. Do I play like the I Stand Alone riff by fucking I don't know. I don't even know what to play. Like I'm just like my my." <laughs> I'm picking on the sixth string and playing on the eighth string. Like my brain is just not <laughs> like not conducive to this, you know, whole situation. So I it, just basically forces like, you to play Meshuga riffs. I, you, yeah. It, yeah. That's what I was going to say. You really realize how Meshuga wrote their albums when you pick up an eighth string. Cause as soon as you yep. hear that low, bow, you just want to do that all day. You just want to, but, <laughs> all day on that another thing about the eight string though i noticed too a little bit is that like it sounds like when i first heard it when i first picked it up and i and i was listening i was going like from the like the first fret to like the fifth fret it just sounded like this to me it's just all da, 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 da. <laughs> it was just like so low the whole time that i was like i can't even hear like a note definition from it i was like it's just yeah. so bass you know it's like i don't know it, it kind of fucked me up but yeah no it's especially definitely bad like, when you do what i do and you down tune an eight string too so now it's jesus you know. what are you tuned to e or something uh no let's see yeah my low strings in e flat okay so everything's flats and for yeah, the we had a special album. eight string tuning on uh on Nibelin. yeah it's in standard eight string tuning was the whole album on eights? I thought it was no, no, the, the, just the binary resurrection song. Just right? the binary last song. resurrection, yeah. and that's tuned to. That's the only song in that album that's tuned to standard, and it has a, a standard eight, eight string tuning. I love it, how you guys saved no, it for that. No, oh. Nate. No, it's oh, drop. Here we go. Here we go. D, 
And then the low note, the low string is to E. So it's basically having nah, a seventh nah, string. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> oh, here we go. Nah, 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 nah. Oh, we got shipped the Meshuggah guitar, and you made the executive decision to not change the tuning because he said, dude, it comes standard in this tuning. You're going to fuck up the thing. Well, I'm not talking about E or E flat. I'm just saying that it's drop B or B flat. So it's it's open tuning to A. So the chunk. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah, no, I, I was talking about the half step down. No, I'm not talking about the half step. If I'm you just look saying, at, if you I'm look at the only way I can comfortably, song. the only way I can comfortably play an eight string is to treat it like a seven string that's dropped. And now I'm going to play specific stuff with that low string. Yeah. yeah. But having it tuned the way it's supposed to be tuned, like, uh, uh it's like like Nate said, I'm going to play nothing riffs. I'm going to play. Yeah, with sugar riffs because this is sounding weird. Would you double drop? Would would you like double drop where you'd have the seven string like a, a drop and then like the eight a drop too? So you oh. could like yeah okay yeah okay. it goes down to E. So it's no, you e and e. did you drop both strings, Max? Yeah, we dropped. So the seven you treat the seven strings the way we treat our seven strings from B to A, okay. and then you drop the lowest string from F to E. Jesus. You played the song like that. <laughs> yeah, because all those weird riffs. Da, 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 da. Yeah, see, this is, where, like, this is an example of uh, so <laughs> that that song binary resurrection is thirteen. That was that song had a stem before I joined the band. Thirteen. And I don't so know that, why it's called thirteen though. It's the first written song for that album because it came after twelve. Uh, but that song, <laughs> twelve wasn't was twelve done before binary? No, none of them were done. None of the stems were done until they, they got workshop by all of us. And that's why Omnivalent, I say, is written by the, the three of us, because every song has all our riffs in it at, by the end of it. The stems became, well, now Nate has a section to put in here. So we had it in thir 13. I think a lot of Tim riffs are in 13. I think Tim wrote the whole beginning of 13 as a down tuned six string and showed it to us. Like, he, he but was it wasn't 13. It was like it was a chunk of a different song. Yeah. It was we just pasted it onto the I beginning. Was so low that we're like, Oh shit, you need an eight string for that one. That that's might crazy. as well just talk about the writing of all of these songs now. Cause I have no idea how much time has gone by now, but like two hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah a little yeah, more. Two hours. I, I was actually going to add that. Like there was a while ago. I was like, where am I? put in a like shoehorn a question in about writing because that's what i want to hear about is the songwriting and real yeah. quick before we go to the songwriting, do you think it's the tuning is going to get so low that like only like cats and dogs can hear it like it's going to be like <laughs> they got gonna nine be like... <laughs> a nine string string the frequency so that makes you just yeah. shit your pants dude you yeah. don't hear it but you just shit your you're pants just, you're just going to hit it so it's going to be so, nothing but like the, cats start freaking out the lowest i know is uh humanity's last breath uses an octave shift down on an eight and it's pretty insane. <laughs> Let's get uh, the bass shift. So and what is that done in in post? It's like an eight eight string like pedal. Bass. I mean, that's yeah, that's but it, it sounds fucking sick, dude. It's on like, frequencies. It sounds fucking cool. Like, Does it? Oh, man. Does but uh, it but they're like kind of the only band I know that is I, I like in that style. So well, I, think, I give going... them. Yeah, yeah, the credit it was for, going for down that, that road for a while. Like yeah. people were like going di lower tuning, lower tuning, nine well, string. Mashuga on uh, on nothing like that. That one song <laughs> where they went as low as the bass notes, right? Um, uh, gun, gun, gun. Yeah, is that shed or what's that yeah. one called? Spasm. Dude, I'm terrible with song names. I just know all the how to play them all. <laughs> I, I think, uh, <laughs> That's I think, uh there's a Mashuga song. Obzen is pretty low sounding. I don't know if they down tune, but I don't think that's in standard eight. I tried to play that on my eight and it didn't sound like I was yeah. in the right tuning. So Ob something on Obzen, the song Obzen has a low, low tuning in it, I think. Right, Max? Obzen? Something's up with Obzen. There's something fishy about that song Obzen, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah, Actually, but, Chris from Dreamer was telling me about that song too, that it's a different tuning than the rest of that album. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I tried to play it and I went, oh, they're like two steps below my eight string and I'm a down tuned eight string. So I think they, they, yeah. but it sounds crystal clear too. So there's clarity in production that you can get. I think you have to really dial in your gain at that it's point. Kind of funny songwriting on that song. But the thing about eight strings too is what you end up doing with the bass is tuning up your bass. So you're in the same register as the guitar. Because if you down tune 
a bass, it just sounds like sloppy dick sauce. So you fucking yeah. <laughs> you, you bring it to the guitar register. So now it's like you have three just, bases, you know, just a texture thing at that point. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so songwriting question, what is it? What are we doing? Well, I don't know. Oh, they want to talk people. about the songwriting of Omnivalent. So do I. I, mean, I was th- eight years old listening to Master. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, okay, did I, so wait. Yeah, go ahead. Cognitive dissonance. Uh, just to let you know, two revelations was uh, thrown together in like a day. So I actually helped arrange that one a little bit with you guys. That was the only right. one. But like the other songs were like me and Tim grueling, took a long time. Uh, we put the stamp of approval on each song. They were done. And then we're like, we don't have enough songs. And I, you know, there's merged. I'm proud of that stuff because you're hearing like my music from my room that wasn't death metal influenced he's also playing drums with keith from montaging too oh that's all merged no, 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 merged merged yeah oh, wait, this is the other one never mind i don't know so, what I'm yeah so you know there's the five songs middle song is the acoustic clean song eye of the storm what i like to call it mm-hmm. but then revelations was like uh i've been practicing sweeps and uh the solo in that song is inspired by the solo and we bleed uh, off of and then you'll beg where you got a sweep and a tap on the top just to make it incredibly hard <laughs> <laughs> but that song is like songwriting and we just we're like okay the the first drift needs to be like hyper cryptopsy da, 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 da. we just really tossed that song together and wrote the riffs like on the phone like mouthing riffs like hey it's gonna go ja, da, 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 no guitars and hands <laughs> and then just recorded that so that, it's funny because a lot of they're like different crowds like some people are like that's the song some people are like no that song sounds wanky compared to the other songs it's like <laughs> but uh then when recording started for omnivalent literally tim came over to my house and he sat at the computer and it was just me so combining me learning new things on guitar and writing riffs and hearing Ion Dissonance and Crow Path and Gore Guts. Um, something happened. It's good and bad. I don't know. It's, it's carved in stone now, but I started writing things where I didn't have to tone it down or teach Tim. So it was like, I just wrote a crazy riff. I just wrote another crazy riff and Tim's recording it all. And there's these demos of that. And uh, there's like, there's, a riff in binary where it's it's hard like soloing legato stuff that i'd learned high up on high strings and i did it all on low strings it's almost like a solo turned into a riff and uh that was so that's 13 and then the beginning of 12 is solo sunder rip off and the <laughs> riffs immediately after that are solace rip off and um some of it, it's like Tim programmed drums to things that I didn't even play in a, a time or looking back at it, I wish I had toned it down a little bit so I could maybe try to play it now, but it's pretty damn crazy. And he programmed two things that we were just throwing together. Or he's just sitting at a, in a chair and like, yeah, yeah, I like that more. <laughs> and then yeah. there well, was from everybody too. Like Tim felt he was like directing and, uh, we were all directing in a way like in this, this studio is where uh, it ended up being recorded after Max's room. We changed and brought it to here to record it. And we finished writing the album in this studio. And that's where I feel like we got some cool collaboration out of the three of us and working stuff out. And really uh, we, we started writing together and, and including me, which was as a songwriter, that was big for me. Right. I, 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 I like writing songs. I've always practiced songs. So now my favorite guitar players were saying, yeah, Hey, write with us. I was like, yeah, I, I, I'm up to par with being able to write where I'm writing riffs that they think are cool now. So that mm-hmm. that's cool to me. And, uh, Omnivalent is, I would say the three of us in this room trying to finish this album and trying to push boundaries as much as we can in technicality, rhythmic stuff, speed i i mean we wrote riffs on the phone like he said talking to each other on the drum set i'd play stuff tim would play uh so it was really passing the guitar on but i think none of us can play each other's riffs 
uh, yeah. on that album. So and it really, you know, people come into my studio. I always have people come in. I always say, let's jam. And people come in and we, we play guitar. It's part of what I think is fun in my studios. So mm -hmm. every time people go, oh, dude, play that song. And I'll go, hell yeah, I'll play every riff I know of my parts. And then they'll be like... <laughs> Here we go. That's Max's riff. Here we go. There's Tim's riff. Here we go. There's my riff. You know, and, that, and I feel like that's from every one of us where we can play maybe our parts of that, but the sum of it is is gone for us. It's it's in the recording. And part of Max saying, "Well, I don't need to play this anymore live." Meant there's some shreds on that that are fucking out of this world shredding now that would take time to get to a live status. You can always play them, though. I think everything, we've never bullshitted our playing, too, though, in the sense that Max is an extremely good guitar player. He can play that shit. You know, uh, he's not he's not playing something he couldn't play eventually. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? If, you know, I, and for me, I can always play my riffs. I never write something that I can't play. I always will write riffs that I can play in succession because I like playing with people. And even Omnivalent, I started rehearsing with Marco and playing, uh, What Max, what's 15 called? Is that Hypnogog? Maybe. Did, uh, Crack City. What's Crack City called? Oh, Demiurge. We, okay. we Demi coined that name first. Yeah, Demiurge. Yeah, so <laughs> Demiurge is a song like... Uh, Meshuga second. Meshuga and cra crazy rhythmic stuff, and I was playing that with Marco, and we played the whole song together. Uh, what's 14, Max? 14? Well, uh... By Cruciforms? By Cruciforms. So by Cruciforms. So you wrote you wrote like the whole beginning of that song. I and wrote the, the first the song thing that in the I middle. rehearsed with Marco and played to play live. I could play that with Marco. So when we, we Actually, another example of that song, my riffs are sweeps that I learned, but they're played on the low strings. Yeah. Oh fuck, that part's so sick, dude. Holy shit. So I wrote I wrote that and I wrote the it's hard like hard to explain without singing the riffs no i know exactly what you're talking about yeah. so nate wrote like 70 percent of that song and uh -huh. i went to rehearse at marco's house one time and they were shredding like the first half of that song and marco handed me a big glass bong and i hit it and i got all i got all weird and i'm watching them play and i'm like i don't want to do that <laughs> <laughs> like i don't want to learn how to play that at all like this is not appealing to me nate's shredding he knows his riffs they're nate riffs but like with you know us hovering over him like making anomalous riffs so just not that they're better or crazier than ontogeny riffs or just like always harping on him like no make it a this diminished chord and play it like Instead of that thing you just did that's chromatic, make it spread across the fretboard and all diminished. And I feel so like yeah. most of my riffs actually didn't get changed note-wise. They always got changed, make it more fucked up. They always got, hey, let's take a section of this thing and add it in there and put a little section of this thing in there. So riffs always became like, we got to hint at this riff coming up by putting this little thing in this riff. And we got to hint at this thing coming up for a bigger picture of this riff. And so, and, so here, that. and here's a, that song specifically, here's another aspect to make it even harder to play. Nate takes, or Tim takes a, a bunch of pre-recorded riffs of 14 by Cruciforms, goes home and plays like mismatch like he he takes this riff and he puts it here he splices another riff here and he makes literally four different versions of the first half of that song until he got it to the point that he felt like okay this riff needs to come okay it needs to build up here then this riff should be here so it's like whatever nate learned last week in succession tim literally chopped it into pieces and Jeez. changed the organization of where those riffs are played brings it back and now he's got the program drums of that demo yeah. that he just made and me and they are like whoa okay cool <laughs> next yeah. so was that worrying about performing it was like uh no we can't even bother to think about that we need to finish this yeah it was um, always just finish the album was kind of the goal i feel like live was yeah we, we always just thought of the album this is what's gonna be it was freeing though but yeah. like you guys are saying about having time in the studio where it's like, we're chilling at Nate's house. Yeah. Or like, you know, getting ripped all the time and talking philosophy and me and Tim arguing a lot. Nate chilling like, dude, guys, come on. 
stop talking about, you know, that's one thing I actually have to do too. And, and, uh, with Tim is that me and Tim got in an argument in 2016 on the internet. I don't even know what it was about to the point where he was went bananas on me. And then he, um, blocked me. And I was like, <laughs> I was, it was like one of those things, but it was, it was me. Cause you know, you know, obviously we don't do politics on the show, so I'm not going to get into what it was, but like, even if I agree with people on what they're, whatever they're talking about on stuff, when people come across too cocky and certain about things, I will argue with them even if I agree with them. So it was one of those ones where I just kind of was like give devil's advocating him a little bit. And uh, yeah. it just we just both blew up at each other. And then like it fucking <laughs> and that's actually I was like, I was thinking about that when you're talking about Tim a bunch. I was like, damn, I got to hit that guy up. And, you know, I was just kind of like maybe had a bad day or something. And just we just both went at each other's throats and just fucking well i mean it's 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 happened with us and yeah you know it 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 is what it is you you move forward people do have bad days and yeah there were i mean i remember times where you know like me and tim are fighting about a riff or i would i would be elitist a lot of times and be like look dude Mm -hmm. you're not even a guitar player because you don't practice and i'm better than you blah 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 but you know why i'm better than you like yeah not because I'm better than you, just because I try harder. But like, yeah. you know, sometimes it's like I'm aware that I'm using that as ammo against him just to piss him off more. Yeah, yeah. And then he can come back with like, well, you're writing lame riffs or or something that could yeah. have its own weight. But then like being sick of seeing each other, too. It's like, well, fuck you. And yeah. then they'd like go to the store or Taco Bell and I'd like sit and write something and everyone chilled out. And he comes back and he's like, oh, it's a sick riff. So it's like, yeah. I mean, I feel yeah, like I the internet is a bad representation of where somebody's coming from always. Definitely. Right? You never, Definitely. first off, you, I, I never can say somebody's fur- furious and anger just because they're arguing online because maybe they're just saying, yeah, fuck you, buddy, you piece of shit, you, you know. But meanwhile, they're just sitting there like, hey, what's for fucking breakfast? This guy's a cocksucker, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I, I don't know uh, anyone's intention unless there was yeah. something. I mean, I, I got a funny story. And I, and I just got to share. I just got to share this story really quick because I'm not generally a troll or someone to get myself in trouble on the internet. But if you rewind to like 2010 and 2012, you know there was a time when the internet didn't exist. So it's like I wouldn't take what I said so seriously on the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, it, so I just say whatever I wanted, and I got myself kicked off of Giorgio Sukulis' Facebook page. The dude from Ancient Aliens with the hair. <laughs> <laughs> because wow. he had like a cold and back in the day i used to be a raging drunk and i knew what it was like to be hung over and get like the flu when you shouldn't be because you drink too much mm. but i would always like eat raw garlic to to get better and like got herbal power so i went on a tirade on his facebook page and i block posted like a huge paragraph like 10 times and i started arguing with people on, on his page about he garlic? Just, <laughs> uh, about he, garlic. He, he called me Garlic Boy. He was like, we. <laughs> he, he he blocked me. He like I'm banned from his Facebook page. Wow. And the funny thing is, I met him at a convention like a couple months later, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, that was me. Like I was just trying to talk about garlic healing, like your cold, because I cared about your cold. <laughs> he was like, did you bring me any garlic? Oh shit! <laughs> I was like, no. He was like, that would have been epic. This and we, about uh, we like oh, immediately no. started talking about uh oak island and the money pit and he treated me like a friend and i like spent extra money to go to the, the dinner afterward and we puffed and nice made yeah, things better but a, i'm still banned off his facebook page. I know, I know. <laughs> i'm still banned off his facebook page though but yeah, but yeah. The, with the with that you know i feel like we were more brutal on each other than anybody but the, uh that made an almost what it was, right? It, that that same time again, I don't know intentions of anything or anybody. I don't know if somebody's pissed off or anything, but I think Tim was off of social media altogether at that point, anyway. So, I, technically, he's blocked me at this point too, right? So, uh, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's uh. Yeah, you can never anticipate what's going on in somebody's life. Exactly, going on somebody's head. You know, for all I know, somebody could be going through the worst thing in the world, and all of a sudden, somebody's saying, 
hey, Cannibal Corp sucks is like, bro, they're the only thing I got. You know, I don't know. So like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hope this doesn't bother Tim, but like he falls in the category of like troubled artist, and it makes a lot of the stuff that he's created have that extra. I'm not saying you have to be troubled to make something good, but it definitely when it adds to us clashing and we still got something out of it, like we still push through. Yeah, it, it's part of why the album sounds the way that it does. Like I look back and I'm like, I harmonized almost every riff. <laughs> Like he harmonized there, almost every riff. Those but not only did not only did I almost play. harmonize every riff, it's like I, I wanted to see every color possible. Like at the end of Omnivalent, the song, just a simple riff at the end, I harmonize it in a fifth and a minor third. Like I should have picked one because it's played twice. And I'm like, oh, it's played twice. Well, the second time needs to be a different one. And just that's all over the album where it's like hearing well, the riff in every we possible thinking, version I, of itself. I remember what we were thinking writing Omnivalent and what you were saying too is dude, Injustice for All, fucking 20 guitar <laughs> harmonies in the background and that. Oh, the, yeah, like the, the fading intro to that album? Exactly, the fading intro to Black uh, and all those harmonies, like that influenced a lot of that stuff and the Ebo stuff. And, well, yeah, uh, no, and Mitosis now is like, uh, got a shout out to Scott Carstairs. He bumps Mitosis on his Twitch streams because he's just bought himself an Ebo. And he's like, there's this song out there that utilizes the Ebo mm. to a pretty a far extent. And I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just saying, yeah, I took advantage of writing a two minute intro to mitosis and it's seven tracks of Ebo yeah. building this wall of chords that, that flow and they change. And uh, part of anomalous, I think comes from, for me anyway, I, I won't speak for Max or Tim, I guess, but for me, it, it comes from insecurities too. Like, uh, this riff isn't good enough yet. We gotta, we gotta fuck it up. We gotta make this something that we haven't heard. We gotta make this the craziest thing we can. And I still think I suck at guitar. Like that, that's that's by the end of it, I can still listen to this album and say I, I'm still garbage at guitar because I'm playing with fucking Max because Max is way better at guitar. But I feel like Max comes from the same spot of like an insecurity thing because I've heard Max talk about the way he plays. I say, dude, you're wrong. I don't know. I don't know how to tell you this, but you're wrong. Like you're really good. I suck. And Tim's like, no, I suck. So it's this album's written <laughs> yeah. on insecurities. And and I, then I, I and then I meet Holdsworth and I'm stalking him basically. <laughs> and about garlic again? No, no. <laughs> no, like it was cool when I met Mashuga. It just all worked perfectly. Hagstrom is as chatty as I am, and uh, we were getting lit and we talked for an hour and a half. But when I met Holdsworth, it was like, I like probably looked like that the whole, like, whole time I was trying to talk to him. And I you told him he's got to him, really. You just shook his hand. You, you were like, but no, I mean, I met him like five times. I like cornered him multiple times at different shows. And uh, like, luckily, I got to have one of those times before he played the set. We shared a cigarette and I was like, oh, remember that that song uh, Postlude? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Scully Sparenson on bass. I haven't seen that guy in forever. That was a cool song. It's all improv. I was like, I know, I love that song. So that was cool. But then, like, other times after the show, I'd, like, buy him beers, and I'd just tell him he's the best guitar player on the planet. He's God. And he says, you're probably better than me. And I was like, <laughs> like, you just slap me, because what the hell? You yeah. Like, for me, no one, I don't need to argue with anyone. It's fine. You can have your favorite. He's my favorite. Yeah. And this dude just told me basically like in a nice way, like, shut up. You're good too. We're human. Stop looking at me like that. You're freaking me out, kid. <laughs> yeah. So, Sorry for freaking you out, Max. <laughs> so funny. So you I, know, I just no, I just mean it's funny. You can meet it's like Prometheus, like you search for God and God searching for God. And it's like, oh shit. Maybe we should just like yeah. I'll just chill and stop hating ourselves and just keep working at it so that 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 was a uh, you're always chasing something as an artist if like yeah you're gonna speak like all so pretty much everybody the else dude. the all the good ones all the ones that are making quality shit they don't think it's quality enough and that's why they keep making albums exactly like meeting holdsworth was really important for me because growing up being an mtv kid we idolized human beings 
Like mm. we're human beings and they're not really better than us. So yeah. just uh, try and try and make stuff. Stop idolizing people, you know? And like, what's funny about Omnivolent is it was the devoid of trying to make something catchy. Like that's kind of a crazy thing to say to yourself or get in the writing situation and you're not thinking about, oh, they're going to love this. Mm-hmm. You're like, how can I make this crazier? How can yeah. I, how can I make something even like this song is getting so insane. I don't even know if I like it. Can I make like one little island of this song that I like? Like, do I even like this? But it's cool when you're not like tripping about other people. Oh, totally different outcome happens. Cause the first album was like, Ooh, I want to try death metal. I think I could do that. We I used learned- the metaphor, the David Lynch movie, Inland Empire, which uh, I don't know if you've seen that, but it was, it's, a, it's a really twisted David Lynch movie. And David Lynch in general works in a way where he's almost deconstructing something that he's building. And he'll show you what is a semblance of a normal movie in a lot of ways. If you look at Mulholland Drive, it's like there's almost a plot line that's moving in a cohesive way, but he still will deconstruct it and show you something that twists it and makes it so you don't even know what the the movie is anymore. So the album Inland Empire actually was different than everything else that he had did previously, though, because that started on just like three scenes. I think he shot one scene, then shot a random other scene, and then had an idea of tying that together, and then it became this like, I don't know how many years project he did where he was building. There would be times where like he would write script for the next day's shooting the night before. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, the scene when, uh, when it's like the the camera's zooming out and they're like cut, but it keeps going like the movie Mm -hmm. and the movie ended, but now Mm -hmm. like the, the art piece is still going. That kind of stuff inspired me. And also I was trying to point out this blue cube, in the middle right here was inspired by Mulholland Drive. Hell yeah. In the center of that movie, she's got the blue cube. And that's where the, the whole narrative changes at that point. Yeah. Yo, Nexus go. point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, but, but, so but I think also uh, when in Inland Empire, when it ends and it keeps going, you guys, without even asking me, and it, it worked out perfect at the end of Demiurge, you put the ending that I wanted to put to the album which was the first little sound snippet. And you guys played it. uh, You didn't play it in reverse yet. So it's like a fake out ending of the album. Yeah. And then there's this other song. Yeah. So what Max is alluding to is. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. The barrel. Yeah. Yeah. It reverses that thing at the end. So the, the album almost mirrors itself and bookends itself, but that's the kind of the idea we're talking about with the Dave Lynch idea. Got we're it. Dis- we're destructing, we're deconstructing these riffs and we're saying, no, no, we're really trying to build an album here. We're really trying to make riffs and we'll come with a theme that comes back, but then it comes and devolves and co- goes back to that confusion state, back to the chaos state, but, but oh, it's just coming back. It's an album again. Oh, it's gone again. <laughs> so, and, and then it comes back to cycle through to just have this endless loop of the, it, 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 how cohesive really is this at the end of it, you know? In, in the beginning of Mitosis, the two minute Ebo chunk, mm-hmm. I play the, the melody that's in binary. So yeah. there's a link, there's a link there to that extra song that happens after the fake out ending of the album. Yeah. And then yeah. if you hear the, the first riff in before Prematuria starts, it's the last riffs in binary. The other riff. That riff oh. is in binary too, but the. It sounds like Clockworks from Meshuga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We wrote it first. Meshuga wrote everything first, though. That's the problem. And then the other thing that's funny, just to wrap it up, is the end of Prematuria ends with that riff too, but I cloaked it by putting oh, like notes to it so instead of it just being jun, jun, cha, jun, cha, it's dun, dun, da, dun, da, dun, da, yeah. dun, da, so it's the same rhythm but sounds like a totally different riff and there's themes so, throughout too like the the song uh 
Max with 16 called Panacea. 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 So that was a collaborative song between all of us. The beginning chords that I wrote, Max when comes at the end. The Ebos are doing the harmonized chords from the beginning and tying in those themes of the chords that were harmonized there. So there's there's all sorts of overlapping melodic, rhythmic, conceptual themes that just cycle back over and over again because it's that David Lynch thing. It's it, and then in mitosis, there's a clean version of the riffs used in omnivalent. Yeah. So it's like, isn't there a callback to cognitive dissonance at some point in the album? Hmm. Okay. So. I got to admit, I've been listening to Omnipotent for like 10 years. I listened to Cognitive Distance for the first time today on the way to the home to film this. No shit. Wow. And, and it's just one of those things, man. Like, I don't know why I don't check out other stuff uh, from the same band that I worship the, for, the second like album from. Tre Trevor kind of is like, yeah, that too. he kind of picks up. <laughs> but I swear to God, when I listened to then... when I listened to Cognitive today, I was like, dude, there's this is from uh, Omnipotent. If, if you're not confirming that then i'll have to find it and check check with you guys on what i thought yeah I'm but, trying uh, to i don't think there's any riffs that carried over from that it might it have been be, a clean part is it, is it the is it the, the, the song oh, i know what it is, is it? ah it's the it's the it's the ah, sound <laughs> <laughs> oh dude that was it you're right was it. the beginning oh. of the album ah, we bring that back <laughs> okay. So it's an actual vocal. It's a, I, it's a synth choir. I, think. I you mean the synth intros. It's, it's definitely not what I was. Not what I, I thought you were kidding at first. Was, <laughs> <laughs> you, no, we, the you deconstructed that. You'll have to go through it again and timestamp that shit. I'll, I'll I'll find it again, dude. I, I'll listen to it for the second time I ever mean, and I'll, find I'll it again. I'll say cognitive dissonance. The song has like the the melodic death metal stuff going on that sounds a lot like omnivalence intro. It could be that those are similar because they're like the only riffs that are like minor chord and make sense with like a note chord playing in the background. I, sure. I, yeah. Okay. You know, we're going to have to follow up on this one and we should probably start planning the wrap the episode up because we're going hard and going <laughs> hard. pretty far. And, uh, but I, I have a couple questions. I'm still um, eight listening to master of puppets. Yeah. So you're eight. <laughs> <laughs> when does sepultura now? Okay. Um, uh what what's so there's some like gnarly parts where like the drums sound like they're gravity blasting but it's like there's like an extra like gritty sound that comes in is that just the sound of the gravity blast or is that like a effect like uh, what, what part, it's like, so it's like right at the beginning that, of my like, all of omnivalent right I, re I recorded it uh the drums marco played v drums with real symbols on it uh so if it's he did gravity blasting, I think the only gravity blasts we have are high, we call them hyper speeds. Anything that's 300, 320, that's an eighth notes. Digga, 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 digga. He plays a slow gravity blast, basically. So I'm trying to think of times he did hyper speed stuff. And one is in Seraphim Vale. So what riff specifically? It, what what gravity? He was saying in the beginning of by cruciforms. It's right at the top, at the very first thing. Is that by Cruciforms? Is it, Max? Uh, 14. My song? Yeah. Oh, okay. So what that is, is is a it's a Waves plugin called Morphoder, which is a really cool like tremolo effect. And That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, okay. We use it all over the first album, and we use it in the second album. It's the <laughs> sound that we have all over our stuff. Yeah. Uh, so... Whenever we had that gravity blast on that song, we synced up the tremolo to the, the gravity. Oh, uh, that's I thought it was something like that, dude. That's so yeah. sick. So that that's also I would give Tim credit for Explodo Core as a thing. It's what we call the sounds of anomalous. And a set, uh, it really Tim's really influenced and Max and all of us are influenced by like industrial sounds and nine inch nails type stuff. Downward spiral, uh, fragile. Those are I love those albums and we really try to incorporate those sounds throughout as part of the songwriting and we call it explodo core. 
So that, yeah. that, that's what one we of my it. favorite Nine Inch Nails songs is 64 tracks. The way out is through just some trivia. Okay. Eight years old, <laughs> listening to master of puppets. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then is there, is there, are there synths on the album or is it all guitar? There, there are, it's not synths. Everything that we made for sounds, we would record something or sample something and then uh, mess with it. So there's no keyboards. There's no MIDI. Everything is manipulated audio. That we I, built a lot, I built a lot of chords with just like, you know, one guitar note singing. And then you build a, a chord the same, like, like the intro to Omnivalent, the song. Yeah, is is just like a loop of pads, almost like ebos, but just you know, like hitting the string and turning the volume up, and then recording, letting it ring, and then do that four or five times and build a chord, and then they would edit it and turn it into a repeating sound. That proud of answers, that one. Yeah, no, that, no MIDI synths. That MIDI. answers my question. Yeah, totally. Our audio. I think but, cynic. Uh, Panacea. Focus, Panacea yeah, is no ebos actually. Gotcha. Yep. The chords in the background. Well, fuck, man. I, I do have more questions, but <laughs> I think we're going to have to do a part two, dude. Uh, part three for Nate. I don't know, man. This album I can just talk about all day, man. The idea that you would even want me back to talk more is uh, astounding. But, yeah. Uh, dude. I'm happy. I'm, I, I love, a homie, dude. I love talking music. I can talk music all day, every day. Me it, too. It's, it's my favorite thing in the world. Music gives me life. It gives me passion. So uh, thank I you. I could talk about me. I could talk about these like for three hours for sure. Oh yeah. X, call so, me up after this. Let's talk for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so the Soul Niger oh, within. Signed. Yeah. Oh, I I feel like I've been thinking about this that there's some albums that like become come like uh, big later on like Focus by Cynic and Soul Niger within, and I feel like Omnivalent is an album that might and should deserve to have that sort of rediscovery by a whole new generation of fans totally so, yeah you guys are helping uh people hear, we just hear about it which is awesome yeah, yeah. Dude, we feel that you guys deserve it and I, I feel that there's a chunk of people out there that definitely would want their ears definitely want this dude well one of the you know five years of work much appreciated one of the comments was when we posted the flyer was the most tech band to ever tech. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> That's kind of what I was alluding to in the beginning. It's like, yeah, absolutely. That, you know, it, it, but for me, what I liked about anomalous, even joining it, I was a fan of anomalous before I was been a fan of Max and Tim's playing. So joining it, I didn't look at anomalous, like a shred band. I looked at anomalous, like these guys write songs in a really crazy linear way but it's still thematic and the shredding was part of it. Yeah. Uh, I don't think of a, even omnivalent, how crazy it is. Uh, it is definitely, it tested the extent of my guitar playing and I'm sure Max can say the same for his. It, I wouldn't call that a shred album to me because to me, that was five years of a theme. We thought of that as a whole album as we were writing it. Uh, so I think of it as that, and I think of the times of five years of hanging out with Max and Tim and the arguments, the fun times, the Taco Bell, the fucking, uh, all, all that shit. And that, that's what I think about music for me is the memory of the time that I made it always. And that's why I will always do it. It's a stamp in time. And Omnivalent is five years of time. <laughs> and Max's room, my room and all that. So I mean, be stoked. I mean, just be stoked. That that's your fucking thing. I mean, some Fuck people yeah. are like, their thing is like, like I don't know, putting a plant in soil, and that's their that's their that's what you just said described in, in that like super epic rant about why you play music. Theirs is like I just like to plant a plant and make it look. Dude, cool. honestly, if somebody gets the <laughs> joy out of planting a plant, fuck yeah! Uh, I, I think you can have passion about that plant. Horticulturists like you can love that plant. That shit. That shit. I'm not. There's nothing yeah. wrong with it, but I'm just saying, like, like uh, you know, Joel has a problem with arborists. Trying to say, fucking Joel. hate oxygen. <laughs> that was my plan. Um, <laughs> I hate oxygen in pretty colors, dude. No, but it's just if like I see the, you put a plant in soil. I'm like my point is that anomalous sounds way sicker than plants, dude. 
So, uh, <laughs> it was inspired by plants. We're not an anti-plant po- podcast. Just so I don't know. I don't know if any human could really. No, do I think we should not take that plants. stance. Anti-plant, dude. Let's take no, that. No. We're anti-plant. It's like flat Earth and anti-planters, dude. Oh, the Lord. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um. So what? What happened after Omnivolent? Uh, what hmm. happened after Omnivolent? I would say is we had five years of really arguing with each other, being at each other's throats and all that and all the good times. And it was a lot of dealing with each other. And I think people, Max started, uh, had a family, went with his family. Uh, I always make music. So I, if I'm making an almost, I'll do it always. If I'm making ontology, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make something. I made Nova with Max. So after, uh, Nova. yeah, Nova sure. after, yeah. I was in the Nova, dude. I was bumping Nova back in the day, too. And I yep. wish we could talk more about that. We kind of avoided that. Really, with our group of musicians, we're a group of musicians that plays in the same way you guys are. Decrepit Birth, Odious, Severed. Everyone's in this group. We have our own group. Just none of our bands are successfully touring or doing any of that. We mm-hmm. we have our own group that live in this block together. Chaz, Soul Asunder, uh, Anomalous, uh, all of this is the same members that we shift around and we inspire each other. Max mentioned Omnivalent was inspired by Soul Asunder. Soul Asunder rehearsed with Max. I'm in Soul Asunder. I was in Soul Asunder. They rehearsed uh, in my basement. Yeah, and Nova was Chaz who wrote it and said, I want Max and Nate to be on this and we're going to get Mark Hawkins. So we, we did that afterwards. Max has been on Ontogeny albums with me every time I could get him in my house to play a solo. All those solos you hear on anomalous and on ontogeny or max improving and finding his jam because max can improv like a motherfucker so uh those are all i saw saw it on your twitch channel recently dude yeah i hate performing stuff you know i like playing (laughs) so yeah so max Max, your your twitch stuff because that's that's becoming a thing now is there a certain time that you're doing it or are you doing i'm trying to hammer all that out but i just got my email that i'm affiliate now Nice. So, uh, it, the dream is coming true, like kind of quick, actually. Scott Carstairs and Nate like inspired me. Scott Carstairs was talking about having to, you know, put a pause on his band and figure out another way, and he found another way and wasn't expecting it to blow up, and it's blowing up. And I went on his streams like, this dude's actually like paying rent, shredding, doing what he loves, and like we're able to talk to him and talk to each other and it's live yep. and, and holy smokes. Like it's really the future. I think, I think uh, musicians have crowded Twitch and they've found a place to be. Um, Cause this whole like zoom thing is like the future. And um, if I'm not going to go every day, I'm going to go, I'll, I'll, I'll hammer out some schedule and you guys, you guys know about it, but um, Oh yeah. But you're, you're, all, see, you're seeing what used to happen in Max's room and it, people we, seem to like it because yeah. my whole thing was like one of the reasons I liked certain hip hop or why I like jazz was you have to be well versed at your craft that if someone does throw a guitar in your hand or gives you a microphone, you can rip it, mm-hmm, you know, yep. and you can also rip it different every time. Yeah. Like written solos are intimidating and if you play a wrong note, it stands out. But uh, improv on the spot, that's what's up. And that seems to be the <clears throat> the bread and butter of my Twitch channel. Like throw on either my music or someone else's music and shred over it with soul and shred. And people Max, are luckily Max, digging it. People are, people are digging it. So yeah. it is um, a chance for me to be. I go to Max's channel every fucking time he's playing because it's a chance for me to be back in Max's room. You know, I. I I am the biggest fanboy of Max out there. <laughs> so, I mean, all all I used to do was solo over Straws pulled at random, <laughs> Masuga song. So Heck yeah, I told Scott Carstairs to do that, and it was it like people like that too. I'm not like oh okay taking credit, but I I am kind of uh, my personality is a little bit overbearing when I get in a musical setting. I'm like oh you should try this. Have you heard this song? You should play over this song, and just I have trouble not you know, staying quiet, but he did it. And then he was like, you guys should hear Max play over the song. So I'm like, why am I not doing this? 
And then I started doing it like this, this is different than being in a band, you know, like I've got three kids, uh, I'm stay at home dad pretty much. And obviously you see I'm in my garage <laughs> being able to potentially feed my kids with me improvising the way I've done since I was a little kid. It's like, that's the craziest dream come true for me, even more so than being in a band. Being in a band is hard work. I'm not saying like screw hard work. I just mean you might not get along with the people or whatever happens and people move away. But uh, I feel like you have the opportunity too to, to be big on that. Like, as you kind of had that, you know, that underground, I mean, with the videos, I guess I'm, totally like mixing up but those videos back in the day like watching the you shred and stuff back in the day it had Dame Gibson. Attention. <laughs> yeah 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 it, ha- it literally had my attention like i was like what the fuck is going on like and uh you know with the like we said the we've mentioned a couple times on this podcast the cult like following of anomalous and stuff like that i feel like and you know you have like you know like naveen all these like big dudes that like really you know i've had i forget who i other huge guys have like brought up anomalous before to me. And I'm like, that's like their little like gem, you know, that they found. And I feel like you could really use that. And I think you should start playing as much as you can and, and yeah. never stop, man. I thought actually what I thought in my head when it's an, with anomalous kind of disappearing, I was like, Oh, Max probably quit guitar or something. And you know, never. All that stuff. that's what I thought. That's what exactly that's the thought I had. I was like, never. Oh, he's gone. He's just, he stopped playing that. That shredder stopped playing is what I thought. So Max, I, I, Max doing what he does has always been inspiring to me because Max is never worried about like, Oh, I have to be at this metal show playing this show in front of people. Max being in his room playing was making him just as happy doing that. And that to yeah. me was so inspiring as a musician, just seeing like, wow, the, my favorite guitar player is playing guitar on the West portal in between delivery pizza driving, just shredding <laughs> fucking everyone on the street right now. My favorite guitar player. Like I felt like just going to the street and just going, how is no one watching this? Yeah. Right yeah. Now? You know? yeah. Dude, your, your wife's brother, I believe ordered a pizza and I recorded one of the solos on uh, hymns, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, I delivered, I delivered that pizza. Yeah, Max came so you, to my house with so a So you drop off a pizza, pizza pick I, up a guitar, shred a solo, and you're out. And then go back to work. That's so funny. You recorded that in <laughs> the middle of a pizza delivery? That's hilarious. That's but that, that's the whole thing of being like, study your craft, because what if that's that's it? We had half an hour or an hour. Yep. And we like reminisced and catching it. attempted catching the song a couple times and then press record and and just that's always been so inspiring that Max and then Max has never really cared about the shows or the, the that it's always been. I mean, I did, about- I did, but like also, it takes hard work. You can't just play guitar and play shows. You have to be like an adult with responsibilities and execute it. And you can't just be like, oh, I'm cool. I'm playing in my room. I booked the show. You know, you got to rehearse with the band. You got to. You got to take care of things. I didn't really take care of those things back in the day. I just wanted to play my guitar. So luckily that made me good at guitar in a certain way. And now the fact that it can be on Twitch for you guys to come chill and watch and make requests or, you know, I'm going to try and play some anomalous songs and play new solos over it or. Yeah. Make it a set time, man. Cause I want to, I want to look forward to a plan to see it. You know what I mean? Cause you know, working and all this stuff all the time, like, if I have sure. like it's like on a Wednesday or something, I'll be like, fuck yeah, well, I got something to do Wednesday. I'm psyched. I'm like well, yeah, I, I'm it's funny, I've only been doing it for like two or three weeks. Yeah. But now I've got like 58, 60 followers. And nice. I got the e- email from them saying we would like to invite you to be an affiliate. That's what Scott was telling me. He was like, get it going. Let's do the let's get the foot in the door. And uh let's get Scott on there and just fuck around. I mean, you know. Scott's a oh, big well, name, dude. Let you guys know he's uh, he's having me on his channel tomorrow no, on his nice. Twitch stream. What time? Because I let believe him know, it starts at five. Let him know that we want him on here too. If you want to pass that information too, he's totally always been. You know, I've hung out with him at Nam a couple times or Nam. Uh, Shout out to Scott. Yeah, yeah. I, I keep hearing nothing but the. I mean, and I feel bad because I haven't really looked. I know Fallujah's like fucking super successful and like doing really good. I haven't really put the time in and I, I know that they have their style that I need to check out. And um, 
I'm a big yeah. Fallujah fan. So Same I mean, thing the bass player I was friends with for a while. I just, I just. And, in the yeah. last couple of months, because I've I've followed him on Instagram and I he covered a Holdsworth solo to the T, and I was yeah. like, dude, okay, I need I know of this guy because of Nate. Yeah. And but I put the work in now and I'm listening to more songs and I'm like, this guy is so polished and yeah. perfect and a nerd about the guitar. He says that all the time, like he's a nerd about it. And I love that. It makes a fire under my ass to be like, I used to be like that. I'm still like that. I can do that. Kids, give me two hours. <laughs> Scott is in Check out Nomadic family too, because Scott did an ontogeny guest solo. Scott and comes it's down. Bad ass. It, it's a great solo. He he comes down to my studio and jams whenever he's in the Bay Area, and we hang out. And uh, Scott's a brother, so absolutely, we'll try to get him. I mean, he's got two thousand. He's got twenty five hundred followers, and it, yes, he plays death metal, but he's all about the fusion too. And it's like he's creating this uh, environment for all of us to come chill and and voice our opinions and suggestions and he wants as many channels of shredders as there can be and you know all of us getting back together maybe you know record stuff together whether it be in person or not it's just oh yeah keep creating stuff you should join so, Fallujah, dude <laughs> <laughs> i'll be the third guitar player that plays like a solo <laughs> <laughs> but Oh, we're gonna wrap this up, boys. Yeah, we should. Oh, there it is. Nice, dude. (laughs) Um, plug that chat. Plug the Twitch. What is? What do people need to check? How do they? Max Anomalous, right? Yeah. Max Anomalous on Twitch. I've had that screen name for since 2005, so I'm gonna keep going with it. Easy to remember. (laughs) And Nate, I wanted to talk to you real quick about ontogeny. Real quick, just are you guys doing working on some new shit yet? Yeah, I got uh, probably five songs written. The next album is going to be Fucked. Um, I'm doing a whole different approach for this next album. As I mentioned, no programming. I'm writing everything by memory. And I'm also experimenting with the idea of I'm doing production changes every riff inside of riffs, too. So I'm basically going to record the album over and over and over and over again and take different types of production in mid song. You're going to have different productions in the middle of a riff. It's kind of uh, going to, I'm going to see if it works. I don't even know if it's going to work yet, but but in my head, it's making sense. So we've been practicing. I want to change drum tone throughout the song and that's going to be really hard. I have to record the song over and over again. So, Cool, dude. We're, we're discussing how to do it, but yeah, I have five. Where can, where can, are you selling merch or anything? for ontogeny uh I, according to kenji our bass player our website is still down <laughs> 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 that, that has been confirmed as of last week i know on this uh, podcast I said that. that's what you were saying on your podcast that i was yeah, and then it was research that it wasn't down but kenji said no that it is down and i went no nah, dude they looked it up you were wrong this whole time <laughs> said, no you're wrong and he went and he showed me and it sure enough if you try to purchase something it's like nah you can't do that. Uh, you know? It just teases you. Yeah, it's so. Sure. But that being said, no one's trying to purchase this right now. You know. Well, uh, go yeah. listen to that shit. If you haven't fucking checked out on Tajani, you're missing out for sure. Well, I, I appreciate that. We're gonna play at the Parkside in San Francisco. There we go. Oh, that's right. I'll be there. The, uh, end of September, Parkside in San Francisco. If Dude, I can that, play that new nice. song with, go check it out. I'll do it. I'll. I. I might be there. Yeah, I'll be up in the bay. Bro, might, might be by dude, then. let's dude, do that means fucking... you're jamming, right? We're jamming, bro. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Oh yeah, I'm yeah. down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Send me, Studio. send me, send me demos so that I can come a little prepared. I kind of want to be uh, there too. Like, oh no, okay. cruise down, dude. Uh, let me let me define how I say jam. By the way, when I say jam, I mean you're coming here and we're just playing some shit and having fun and talking and shooting the shit and. That's it. I don't, I'm not writing a goddamn thing. <laughs> I, 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 I don't, nothing's productive in my jam sessions, oh, dude. Even, even when they're supposed to be. I love jamming. I, I had a TVV rehearsal with Diego two days ago and we just jammed anytime in between the songs we have to rehearse. I just love jamming with guitarists when I'm playing drums. It's so Hell fun. Yeah. So That's I can't wait to add you to the many guitarists I've jammed with, man. Dude. Hell yeah. And you know, just, Hanging out, shooting shit, talking music, just like you're doing here, happens in this studio all the time. Every time I can, if somebody says, hey, I love your stuff, like, 
sure, cool, come here and let's play music together because that's what this is all about. Music and sharing that with each other, you know, and th this death metal scene that we're in can seem like, damn, that band's big. This shit's small always, you know. This is a niche, uh, just a small genre, even at the biggest level of it. So this mm -hmm. this brotherhood of the pound days and this now and coming yeah. here jamming, that, that to me is the metal scene alive, you know. Totally, dude. Fuck yeah. Keeping those connections, dude. Oh, yeah. Long time yeah. connections. All right, well, fuck yeah. Joel doesn't guys. like the horns, by the way, so fucking <laughs> the horns. Fuck. All right. <laughs> let's wrap it up guys thank you so much nate and max Fuck thank yeah. you for yeah. having us. out with us tonight yes. this is awesome Super sick, dude. all the kind words i appreciate it yeah for sure we know if you ever want us back oh, oh most yeah. definitely dude. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. you're always welcome we'll talk about when i was eight listening to master of puppets <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, dude, I think perfect. we should go back to 1945 when your dad was uh, in the race. In the union. <laughs> Hell yeah. yeah. All right. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah, guys. Thanks oh, all yeah. the subscribers, new subscribers. Welcome and thank you. And fucking. We're on Spotify now, by the way. Oh, yeah. Fine. Fuck. We got, we got that. Two yeah. things I left out at the top was yeah. Spotify and a new Mersey, dude. A new Mersey. That's Thanks nice. so much, Murdoch. Fucking love you, dude. Um, <laughs> But yeah, dude, Spotify, fucking all the other. Now it's like, what else do we need to be on? I guess we just got to wait for somebody to be like, why aren't you on this? And I'm like, that's it. Dude. <laughs> acid. Yeah. All right. Well, podcast peaking on acid. <laughs> I wonder if on anybody Spotify. has, dude. I wonder if anybody has. Got a podcast yeah. on acid? I'm sure it's been done. Yeah, yeah. Or, I'm done no, to do it. I'm well, done to yeah, try that it. for sure. I'm saying listen to this on acid. I'm sure it's been done. <laughs> Little micro. Probably like four or five times. It'd probably be a really big bummer this on acid. Though. <laughs> <laughs> this would just suck on right acid. Right on. All right. Well, so again, don't do acid. If Listen you to Anomalous if you're on acid right now. Oh, I would Ooh, say that fuck. might be a bummer too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Fuck yeah. I tell us this would be cool. Yep. See you guys next week. Fucking you guys rock. We love you. Thanks again, Nate, Max. Fuck Welcome yeah. On, guys. Love you guys. Uh,